But you can't see me fake. You can't even see me now. No, I can't see you do anything. Well, before you could. Anyway, we are live. This is This Week in Science. We are experiencing some technical difficulties. For some reason that I can't figure out. I was live video, but a moment ago, and now, now, I'm a stock photo of my former self. Well, oh well. This is this is how it shall be. You can't get a picture of yourself out there. <laughs> I can't. That doesn't. I don't know how it uh, happened, but like there's a a little button. If I try to turn the video on on it, mm -hmm. it actually hides me. I... Still muted. See, like I have no. No, I can hear you again. You can hear me again, away. but where is my? Where is, doesn't like my video? Is there something wrong with your camera? It was, but it was just working, right? You saw me a minute ago, right? I never saw you. I only saw the <gasps> picture. Oh, uh, the first hangout, the one that wasn't the this live mm -hmm. on air broadcast. No. Nope. I saw. I saw the picture also. Huh. Such a strange, bizarreness. Oh, it says I don't have a camera. Hang on a second. <laughs> so strange. I know I have a camera because it's, you know, we've had it before. Oh, come on, Google. I know you can. I know you can. I know you can Google. I know you can go Google. I can see you. Let there be light, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters of science. There is light being captured, finally. All right, I'm going to save these settings. Bam, and we should be ready to roll. Is this the uh, hot mic? Yes. It is. Oh, sweet. Ken. All right, let's uh, let's uh, do a uh, let's do a, let's do a show. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's no music though, so we're gonna have to. Um, I'm gonna do the disclaimer, and then Blair is going to sing the intro. Nope. 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 <laughs> hum the intro. Uh. Uh. <laughs> Blair is going to per uh, dance as though there were music playing, and I will. Can we I'll do compromise that? Can we on that. that one. Okay. We'll do that. Here we go. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Presenting scientific subject matters in their perfected form alone provides no road to learning. If the symbols, equations, and terminologies are taught alone, the result will be little more than a peculiar vocabulary. Symbolic order is not a form derived from the world. No, it is a form imposed upon logic. A way for us humans to organize and utilize our knowledge. And the idea that a student of science can be saved time and energy, protected from needless error by commencing only where the previous inquiries have left off, is to overlook the greatest insight that science has achieved, the highest inspiration of the scientific mind, and an important aspect to knowledge. The act of proper observation, an obsession with the unknown, the experience of failed ideas. To begin an education with known technical concepts and their definitions alone is to begin at the end and work one's way backward to the wonder and creative freedom of thought that is science. Science is not a symbolic definition of the state of nature, but an intelligent and persistent endeavor to revise current beliefs to eliminate what is erroneous to add to the accuracy of what we already understand, and above all, to describe them so well that those who come after may see them as obvious. And nowhere is this act of turning the unknown into the newly obvious more obsessively observed than here on This Week in Science, coming up next. <laughs> Okay, can we be done now? <laughs> no, because we have to leave enough space for the song, so we have to keep pretending. 
And then this is the part where I start to I wait for it, like the music's about to to, to end. Good science to you, Blair. <laughs> Good science to you, Justin. Here we are once again for another episode of This Week in Science. If you are just tuning in, you turned in right at the beginning. Uh, you may have noticed there is uh, no Kirsten. She is away. Uh, I think she's getting married, as I understand it. No, she's already married. Which is married. odd. It's, I she didn't is know in a wedding. They were having problems. But, wait, she's what? <laughs> she's at someone else's wedding. Oh, well, that's really going to be awkward then. If she's marrying somebody else at their wedding. <laughs> That's going to be really strange. But in any case, even in Kirsten's absence, the science must continue. And today we have a really interesting story about a little probe. Mm. This, is a, this is a probe on Saturn's moon Titan. Landed there. This is the Huygens probe by the European Space Agency. Landed there in January of 2005. And... There's a bunch of data that kind of has been transmitted about when it actually landed. Uh, and they've sort of had to back engineer how the landing took place. Because there's, nobody, there's no observation. There's no observation of how exactly it landed other than it's working once it's there. But they have, they've determined that the probe bounced, slid, wobbled on its way to resting uh, just 10 seconds after touching down on Saturn's moon. Kind of interesting way they did it, too. They had to basically reconstruct a model of the probe here on Earth and like sort of bang it around to get the sort of results that they were, they were seeing in the, in the feedback from it. So the instrument data uh, were compared with results from the computer simulations and a drop test using a model of Huygens uh, designed to replicate the landing. Analysis revealed that on first contact with Titan's surface, Huygens dug a hole 12 centimeters deep before bouncing out onto a flat surface. The probe tilted about 10 degrees in the direction of motion, then slid 30 to 40 centimeters across the surface. It slowed due to friction with the surface, and upon coming to its final resting place, wobbled back and forth five, four, uh, five times, with each wobble about half as large as the previous one. Uh. It should be enough to tell us something about the physics uh, or the uh, you know, gravity on... Huygen, uh, the uh, Titan. Huygen sensors continued to detect small vibrations for another two seconds until motion subsided nearly ten seconds after touchdown. A spike in the acceleration data, which is always confusing because that means something slowed down. A spike in the acceleration data suggests that, uh, suggests that during the first wobble, the probe likely encountered a pebble protruding by around two centimeters from the surface of Titan. Wow, they've really done some testing on what could have caused these things. Uh -huh. uh, and they think that the, it may have been pushed, this pebble may have been pushed into the ground, suggesting that the surface had a consistency of soft, damp sand. Uh -huh. This is a description from Dr. Stefan Schroeder at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research. Hmm. Had the probe impacted a wet mud-like substance, its instruments would have rec recorded more of a splat with no further uh -huh. indication of the bouncing and the sliding and the... And the, the wobbling and the like. We also see in the Huygens landing data evidence of a fluffy dust like material. Most likely organic aerosols that are known to drizzle out of the Titan atmosphere being thrown up and suspended for about four seconds after the impact. Since the dust was easily lifted, it was most likely dry, suggesting that there had not been any rain of liquid ethane or methane for some time prior to the landing. Wow, all this from a 10-second bouncy, slidey thing, you know? This is... Mm -hmm. oh. You know, you say cool. your, your uh, college physics class isn't going to do anything in the real world. <laughs> you know... Th but th this is exactly <laughs> what this it is, exactly is for. Doing. You know, this is one of those things that I've always had a real problem with, too, is when people say, well, you're never going to use this... This geometry or this calculus in the uh, in the real world, right? You do. You use it constantly. You you, mm -hmm. you employ logic. You have different ways of solving problems, of looking at problems and variables. It, no matter what you do, uh, you you have a good thorough mathematical background. You get to learn uh, how to deal with problems and abstraction that stays with you forever. 
What you got, Blair? Um, I have a lot of really interesting things. Uh, I'm going to start with something that we talked about uh, a while back about coffee and Alzheimer's disease. I forgot what that story was about. Yeah, so, so recently, a, a few months ago, there was a study that came out that made it look like coffee can stave off the effects of Alzheimer's disease, which is huge. Just another reason coffee is great for you, right? <laughs> right. Uh, I've, I've heard the same thing for cigarettes, too. Uh, or nicotine. Yeah. <laughs> Not as much, but <laughs> so the coffee, we, we weren't sure why it was uh, having this positive effect, but so recently they've done some uh, experiments with mice to try to see how caffeine prevents memory loss. So at the University of Illinois, they took two groups of mice. One was given caffeine and the other was not. And then they facilitated cognitive impairment, which means they interrupted breathing and blood flow um, to create what's called hypoxia. They gave the mice a chance to recover and then measured their ability to form new memories. Hmm. What they found was that the mice who had caffeine recovered their ability to form new memories by 33% uh, or 33% faster than those who did not get the caffeine. Hmm. This, is, this is a pretty big effect. And they noticed that it was a direct correlation with the anti-inflammatory impact of IL-1 signaling, which is the inflammation associated with Alzheimer's disease. So specifically, it looks like this caffeine is preventing this, this harmful inflammation. Wow, okay. Yeah, now here's the next step. <laughs> this professor at the University of Illinois, uh, his name is Frund, he wanted to look at the brain damage itself and then see how the inflammation and the caffeine and all of that was connected specifically. And <clears throat> he found that the hypoxia that they were causing in the mice creates a chain reaction that leads to what we call cognitive decline from Alzheimer's, all of that. Um, <clears throat> and the caffeine actually stops that chain reaction or at least limits it. And the, what, the, what hypoxia does when, you, when um, you're having the cognitive uh, decline in your brain is it releases adenosine into your brain cells. And adenosine we recognize from ATP. It's uh, the power of brain cells. But what happens is the adenosine basically leaks all over your brain <laughs> and it triggers an enzyme that makes beta cytokine IL-1, which is the inflammation and the hardening in the brain that we see as basically later turns into Swiss cheese brain in Alzheimer's. Mm. And so what they saw was that the caffeine is actually blocking the adenosine receptors. So the brain is not responding to the extra adenosine like it normally would that then doesn't cause the chain reaction that causes the inflammation that causes the cognitive decline. So basically it just stops the chain reaction at the beginning. Cup of coffee a day will keep the doctor at bay. I like it. Yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting that uh, <clears throat> we have all these uh, superfoods or certain things that are supposed to keep you from getting cancer or Alzheimer's or this or that. And it's actually really interesting to then sometimes be able to dive in and actually see why exactly. So I was surprised at how far they went in this study rather than just these mice could remember things and these mice couldn't. They actually took coffee. it a whole extra step. <laughs> they out took it a whole extra step mechanics. further, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Ooh, new research uh, determines that, the, you know, there have been links in the past between marijuana and uh, schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. They've tried to say, marijuana use can cause schizophrenia. Right. Well, 
there's an uh, this uh, thing I'm holding my hand right here says, man, eh, maybe not so much. That may be a correlative. <laughs> Good old correlation versus causation. Yeah. This is a paper by Shiz Hong Han and colleagues in the current issue by uh, biological psychiatry implicates that there's a gene in the risk for cannabis dependence that is also implicated in synaptic development and function and uh, is linked also when there's a problem in this gene it's also linked to schizophrenia. Reacher set out to investigate susceptibility genes for cannabis dependence as research had already shown that has a strong genetic component. I had no idea. I've heard this about alcoholism. I hadn't heard this about, uh, didn't know this about uh, cannabis dependence. Huh. To do this, they employed a multi-stage design using genetic data from African-American, European-American families. In the first stage, a linkage analysis, the strongest signal was identified in African-Americans with chromosome 8P21. Then using a genome-wide association study data set, they identified one genetic variant, NRG1, that showed consistent evidence for association in both African-Americans and European-Americans. Finally, they replicated the association that some variant in an independent sample uh, later. So altogether, the, the findings suggest that NRG1 may be a susceptibility gene for cannabis dependence. <laughs> so never mind your medical marijuana card. <laughs> you got your, no, 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 it's my genome. Yeah, I'm supposed to be smoking this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's right here. It's, it's how I was born. Can't change it. Not my fault. Couldn't that go the other way? If you have the gene, you're not allowed to smoke? <laughs> no, no, no. It means you're, de it means you'll you're get dependent hooked. on it. No, it's, if you're dependent on something, it means you have to have it. Well, it's like if you knew, if you knew that you had the gene for alcohol dependence, wouldn't you just mm. never start drinking? No, of course, no. You'd have to start drinking even if you didn't drink because you know your body needs it. I thought right? the dependence gene would mean that you become physically dependent, which means you get addicted to it when you start. Right. Because you need it. <laughs> See, that's why isn't that you don't so need nobody needs it. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you no. do. If you're dependent on it, if you're addicted to something, you need it. That's what the your body what chemical dependence is. That. Exactly. And who knows better than yourself what you need. But your body wouldn't think you needed it unless you started using it. <laughs> right. Doesn't <laughs> know what it's missing otherwise. <laughs> Exactly. You don't even know what you're missing until you're totally, totally chemically dependent on something. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't even know. It didn't. So wait, but what's interesting about this, that these findings also suggest the link between the genetics of schizophrenia and the genetics of cannabis dependence. NRG1 emerged into public awareness after a series of genetic studies implicated it in, a, in a heritable risk for schizophrenia. Subsequent studies in post-mortem brain tissue also suggested that the regulation of NRG1 was altered in brains of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia. So that after school special that's, you know, warning, if you smoke the marijuana, you may become schizophrenic. Uh, it's probably completely wrong, and chances are uh, you're really attracted to marijuana because you are schizophrenic. <laughs> I don't know. But that, that, that there's a correlation there to uh, being susceptible for dependence. Right. And, so uh, were you saying it's on the same loci, like it's the same chromosome and it's location? The same, it's, the, it's the same gene, uh, gene variant that uh, okay. is, yeah. is, is associated with both. There's All just right. some overlap there. So yeah, so it's, it's correlative, not causative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of those good old things. Science. Hmm. Yeah, it says here the current uh, findings may help explain the already established link between cannabis use and the risk of developing schizophrenia. But uh, yeah, might uh, might be ups, uh, overturning the the idea that it's a cause of the schizophrenia. Right. Right. All right. Well, do you know what time it is? <laughs> Is it time for Blair's Animal Corner? 
Along with Blair. She works at the zoo, likes it, but isn't fond of pandas. That's right. Uh, well, today we have a rather gross Blair's Animal Corner. I know, when what don't we? Today? But, <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, is everyone ready? Chinese turtle. It passes waste through its mouth. I'll say it again. A Chinese turtle <laughs> passes urea, that's waste, through its mouth. Soft-shelled turtles in China were discovered submerging their head under the water for up to 100 minutes at a time, which is super long for turtles because they have lungs. They breathe air. <laughs> so scientists for a while have been trying to figure out why these soft-shelled turtles would stick their head under the water. Now, sidebar, in the past maybe 10 years, we've figured out that turtles uh, can do some gas exchange through their skin, parts of their huh? skin, like an amphibian does. Um, but it's usually <laughs> at their rear. See, turtles are very interesting. That's where the most... Um, porous skin is, is um, in their posterior. So that's where they have a lot of gas exchange. And that's actually how they can stay underwater for a long time is they can get some oxygen through their skin. But their main oxygen source is air. And so they have to breathe air and get their head out of the water. But also in previous research, these guys have been looked at and scientists have seen that their mouth is very porous and different from other turtle mouths that they had seen. And so by testing the water chemistry, when these turtles stick their head under the water, when they submerge their head, they have noticed a giant spike in nitrogen. And they have confirmed that these guys are excreting urea through their mouths, which basically means they're urinating through their mouth. <laughs> you know, I know the turtles live to be ripe old age. Yes. But if that's how they do it. <laughs> <laughs> These are the only turtles we found that do it so far. Okay. So wow. far, I say, because, you know, you never know what's going to be discovered next. Um,. But yeah, over a century ago, people noticed that these turtles had funny tissue in their mouth that was very spongy and velvety. Um, and they had thought that it had to do with uh, gas exchange, like with oxygen, like in their bums when we were talking, when I was talking about before. But right. uh, it turns out it's, uh, for some weird reason, their urea is bypassing their kidneys and it's going through their mouth instead. So this is this is a bizarre, bizarre discovery because until now it was understood all vertebrates, every animal with a spine excretes waste via the kidneys. Mm. They get all get rid of all of their um, urea or uric acid or whatever it is that you secrete goes through the kidneys first and so these guys don't which means we're missing something either they didn't get kidneys or they had kidneys and lost kidneys or they they still have their kidneys but they're not using them we need to and find out repurpose them for some what's other really happening inside these disgusting turtles <laughs> Although there are, uh, oh, no, never mind. I guess there isn't another. I almost said there was another creature uh, with a spine that uh, excretes through its mouth. But uh, I was going to say politician, but, but they have no mm. they, There's no spine. Yeah, so it's spine. true. <laughs> but um, tsh. Do you know what time it is? Uh, what time is it? For Justin's microbial corner. Ooh. Yeah. With Justin. With <laughs> <laughs> so this one's kind of overlaps, the Blair's Animal Corner. Uh, this is new research is revealing 
obvious connections between animal microbiomes, the uh, communities of microbes that live inside animals, and animal behavior. Hmm? Who's really in charge of nature? Ah. Is it nature, nurture, or gut bacteria? According to a paper uh, by University of Georgia ecologist Vanessa O. Ezenwa and her colleagues, the article just published in the Perspectives section of the Journal Science Reviews, recent developments in this emerging research area and offers questions for future investigation. The paper grew out of a National Science Foundation-sponsored workshop on new ways to approach the study of animal behavior. Ezenwa, associate professor at UGA, uh, Odum School of Ecology and College of Veterinary Medicine Department, Infectious Diseases, and their co-authors were interested in the relationship between animal behavior and beneficial microbes. Wow. Oh, I'm already like, whew, this is going to be good. I'm excited. Uh, so, more research, uh, most research on the interactions between microbes and their animal hosts had focused on pathogens. You know, you get sick, and how does that affect you, you know. Uh, less is known about uh, the beneficial microbes or animal microbiomes, but several recent studies have begun to explore connections. We know that animal behavior plays a critical role in establishing microbiomes, she said. <laughs> Once they're established, the microbiomes then influence animal behavior in lots of ways that have far-reaching consequences. That's what we were trying to highlight in this article. Bumblebees, for example, obtain the microbes they need through social contact with nest mates, including consuming the nest mates species. <laughs> Did you know that about bees? No, I didn't. Did you know that they consume each other's feet? Because that, you know, that no. uh, you catch more flies with honey. No wonder. <laughs> Um, Oof. So, yeah, uh, green iguanas establish their intestinal microbiomes by feeding first on soil and later on the feces of adult iguanas. Yeah, it's pretty common, actually. Um, koalas do that, too. That's how they process the eucalyptus is the babies. So it's funny, the mom's pouch actually faces down instead of up like a kangaroo hmm. pouch, faces down, and the babies stick their head out and eat some of their mom's feces, and that has the gut cultures in it that allow them to eat eucalyptus. <laughs> wow. Isn't that yeah. fascinating? Do you know what an animal that eats its own poop is called? What? A coprophage. Coprophage. It almost yeah, sounds so, kind of if you don't know what it means. Yeah, so rabbits are coprophagous. Interesting tidbit for everybody. Oh, animals. At your pub quiz next time, guys. You'll know what that is. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, uh, so here, there's a, a, a lot of behaviors that animals might have that allow them to get different microbes they need at different points in their lives. The microbes, in turn, influence a wide range of animal behaviors because of this, including feeding, mating, predatory prey interactions. One recent study found that fruit flies prefer to mate with others that have microbiome biomes most similar to their own. So, you know, you may look good to me, but I'm not really attracted to you unless my, <laughs> my guts... But microflora match your gut's microflora. I know there's nothing more sexy <laughs> than when someone's gut bacteria is similar to mine. Yeah, it's this, uh, no, 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 no. This is a scientific dating method. This is absolutely the most scientific uh, dating service that's ever been developed. So basically, when you sign up, uh, we send you a sample box. <laughs> you you fill the you, you you deposit your sample. You send it back to us. We analyze it and match it up with your best potential mate. Yeah, forget horoscopes. <laughs> Gut bacteria. I wonder if that would work. I really. I, I mean, I don't want to run the experiment, but I'd like that experiment to be done. You know? That's interesting but, because genetically, you want the person the most different from you. 
Mm-hmm. Or you think maybe it has nothing to do with that. Maybe these are maybe those are just vast accidents that we think that's even the <laughs> case. Maybe it's maybe it's really all about the bacteria that make up our guts, and that's really what's determining everything else. Everything else is just sort of just Justin, sort of window dressing. Isn't everything in nature a vast accident? It, it, Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's super interesting. Now I picture like these gut bacteria that are actually holding the reins inside these giant organisms. Right? No, no, no. I've been saying we're just, we're just big spaceships for microbes. It was just really hard for them to get around on their own. So they developed all these dedicated cells that could move them around. Uh, another study found that African malaria mosquitoes were less attracted to humans who had a greater diversity of microbes on their skin. Hmm. Possibly, though, because certain microbes can produce chemicals that repel those mosquitoes. It's very interesting. Wow. Hmm. So I have a, a very closely related story to that, but uh, do we have time before the break? Um, I don't know. I haven't been looking at the clock or nothing. But I tell you what, why don't you save it? Oh, what cliffhanger. We we're gonna cliffhanger, <laughs> cliffhanger, cliffhanger. We're gonna go to the break, and we'll be right back with more this week in science after these messages. That's right. Messages, 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 messages. No, Wait, we do I have, have to, to, I have to record break. it. I have to record yeah. oh, the audible doing, break. Okay, I'll, I'll be, do it. I'll you go. My thing, and then you okay. can be doing your thing. Okay. Well, stand by, listeners, while my internet works. <laughs> so I'm trying to scroll, and my page won't let me. Okay. Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks with over 75,000 different titles in a variety of genres. Twist has found many science-based books in the Audible library. You can start a free trial today and get any audiobook download for free. All you have to do is sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's audiblepodcast.com backslash T-W-I-S. Go there now for your free download. Twist also has merchandise you might enjoy. Head over to twist.org to purchase our 2010 Science Music Compilation CD. Yes, it's 2010 and a CD. And a World Robot Domination t-shirt is also available. Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, and fun things we try to do for the show. We appreciate any amount, $2, $5, $10, even $100, $100 million. You make this show possible. We accept donations through PayPal and have made the process easy by putting donation buttons on each show page on our website, www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot org. So go to the website, listen to the most recent episode, comment on the show, and make a donation. We thank you for your support. We couldn't do it without you. And now we play music that we do not have. So I'm going to pretend there's music. Woo! Okay, enough of that. <laughs> okay, so we're waiting for Justin to get back. No, I don't have it memorized. I've only done it, what, four or five times? The podcast break. Oh, hey, Justin. <laughs> And intro music. And we're back with more This Week in Science. 
Blair, you had a uh, you had a story at the end that was almost almost made it into the first half of the show, but got cut off by the uh, mm-hmm. by the bridge there. What you got? Well, so we talked first about the turtle that has urea coming out of its mouth, and then we talked about the microbiomes that are actually in control of bigger organisms. Well, speaking of those microbiomes, we've found intestinal bacteria that create their own bacteriophages for personal weapons. Mm. Yeah. So researchers at the University of Texas found that there's a certain type of bacteria that lives in the mammalian gut that creates its own viruses to kill off competitors. Mm -hmm. So phages, which is short for bacteriophage, is a virus created by a bacteria that targets other bacteria and destroys it. And they're in very high interest because if we could harness how they work and make them ourselves, they would be the perfect antibiotic. Chemical warfare, 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 chemical well, warfare. Well, there's that too. It's really, we were hoping just for the medical side. Of course, there's always two oh. sides to that, but it would be a great antibiotic. Um, it could just kind of self-sustain and keep a certain strain of bacteria out of your body. Huh. And oh, wow. Wow. What they that's, found the real, now, that's like the real future then right there. I was like, you know, they've been sort of doing beneficial bacteria kind of things, uh, sort of just, uh, we think these are good. We don't actually know what they did, but they, they don't hurt you. So, yeah, hey, we'll put them in this uh, energy drink, and there you go. It's beneficial bacteria, yeah, it's great for your gut. Well, maybe it does something. We don't know. But having ones that are specifically designed to be watching out for uh, harmful bacteria, harmful microbes. That's that is next level science right there. That's some good stuff. Yeah, and so what they've just found for the first time is a type of bacteria that creates a bacteriophage that attacks an extremely similar bacteria. So basically what it's doing is it's getting rid of its competitors, its direct competitors in the gut. Which means they're making a bacteriophage that is only slightly different from something that would kill themselves. (laughs) (laughs) But so it's... um, it's very interesting to scientists and you know people doing medical research because it's something that they've actually now observed in the human gut, which means it's a human bacteria that actually does target harmful bacteria in the gut to humans. Hmm. So your microbiome, not only steering every decision that you make, according to Justin's story, also keeping you pretty healthy. It's a good deal. Hmm. Well, yeah, you know, basically it's it's just basic maintenance. It's, you know, you change the oil, you create a beneficial bacteria, or you keep out the bad bacteria. You just keep the ship going. Right. Right. Tight ship. Keep the, thing, keep the thing alive. Yeah, and so basically if they can harness the mechanisms that work here, they can take bacteria, they can grow them in a lab, and they can use those bacteria to grow an antibiotic, a bacteriophage, that we can then give to people that harms, that kills the harmful bacteria, but leaves the beneficial bacteria untouched. Because right now, you know, if you take a course of antibiotics, a lot of the time they say, eat lots of yogurt, because you're killing a lot of beneficial bacteria at the same time. Yep. Yep. You're, 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 I mean, you're really altering uh, what's been, uh, what's been running the ship for a while when you, when you take the antibiotics. It's just wholesale slaughter down there. So I thought that was interesting that um, it kind of led right in with your microbiome yeah. story. It's a, it's a whole other situation there, but um, it would be nice if, uh, if we had some antibiotics that were a lot more specific to one genus and species of bacteria. That would, be, that would just revolutionize medicine, I think. 
From the guts of mammals to the guts of Mars. Ooh. Uh, possibly. This is a, the, the curiosity. Tipped over a rock <laughs> recently. Uh -huh. uh, this is the first Martian rock curiosity has actually touched. It's actually messed with. It, uh, it's a, a football-sized rock that they've named Jake Medevyek. Uh, they named the rock? Medevyek, yeah. Uh, so Jake, <laughs> this rock named Jake, it's probably named after somebody. I, I, it doesn't say here. Um, they, they knocked it over. They zapped it with some lasers. They actually used their alpha particle X-ray spectrometer instrument. And uh, as well as uh, some other kind of laser kind of thing. Trying to determine some composition, some stuff like that. Uh, but what was interesting is uh, the rock has a close match in chemical, chemical composition to an, an unusual but well-known type of igneous rock found in many volcanic provinces on Earth, said Edward Stoppler, California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. With only one Martian rock of this type, it is difficult to know whether the same processes were involved, but it is reasonable, a reasonable place to start thinking about its origin. So on Earth, rocks with a similar composition, uh, composition to Jake typically come from processes that take place in the, in the planet's mantle, below the crust, so deep, deep down under the Earth. Right? And yet this... This is a surface rock. This is just mm -hmm. sitting up there, chilling. Yeah. Um, it's normally uh, formed deep beneath the Earth's crust from crystallization of relatively water-rich magma huh. at magma. elevated pressure. Magma. <laughs> water-rich, so though. So so that's kind of a is, is water on Mars, deep below, uh, tectonic activity. Okay. All these things can be possibly sussed out of this one er, rock. So, so back up for a second. You said mm -hmm. that the process that you get this rock by on Earth involves water. Involves a water-rich magma. So at, we did not find pressure. water on Mars. Oh, we did. Sure, sure. We did, sure. like, in other there's, ways. Yeah, there's, like, ice. On Mars right. Place, but but we, did, we didn't find liquid water on Mars. That's not the headline here. The headline no. here is that we found a rock that mm. we would expect, A, to come from the inside of the planet, and it was on the surface. Yeah. And, B, that it requires a lot of water to make. As Water far as we magma. know. Yep. As far as, yeah, if it was on Earth, that's how it gets done. That's right, how it's so there could be out. something else going on that made this rock. Could be. But, but that's the process that we're aware of. So right, right now and we're so thinking... So that's where we're going to start, start, the, start the process. Okay, if it developed the same way it did on, on Earth, which is totally, right. that's the rational place to start. Right. How right. did it end up just sitting on the surface? And what, does, what are the implications for Mars's past? Right. If it had uh, this, you know, tectonic, strong tectonic, volcanic, water-rich magma. Mm. Right. So <laughs> if, it, if there's water-rich magma, that's a good sign for us terraforming Mars, if that's what you're into. And then also, mm. if there's volcanic and tectonic activity, which would be indicated by this rock, because otherwise, how the heck did this rock from the inside of the planet get to the and surface? The surface, yeah. Then that also is very good news for those of us who want to terraform Mars. Also, it's just cool because it means that Mars is a lot more like us than we thought. Yeah. Depending I think we should just terraform with microbes. Uh, we, uh, this is, this is what people They'll take care of it. There's microbes there. Okay, so we've determined so far, thus far, there's no microbes. I say we keep searching for a little while. The next thing, uh, if we don't find anything, we send uh, microbes to Mars. We send some extremophiles. Mm -hmm to go out there, and then there'll be life on two planets. It might be extremophiles, it might be just viruses, who cares? We could put life on Mars. We may actually have already done so, accidentally. Then put it to simmer, wait a few million years, maybe <laughs> then there'll be some plants. Yeah. 
We'll just wait. Come on, yeah. hurry up. Process Come on, of evolution, Mars. you're taking too we're, long. We're Come running on. out of stuff on Earth. Hurry up. <laughs> we got a banded ship. <laughs> so oh, actually, that, so to the quadruple segue backwards. If I do you have you ever heard my uh, my uh, um, uh, conspiracy theory? On, not a conspiracy theory. What is it? My my uh, theory on uh, aliens. No. Okay. So take everything that you've heard about the little green men, the little grays, the big eyes, okay. the little nostrils, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. those little things. Just assume they're all true. Okay. Suspend doubt completely. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, they look like they have two legs, two arms, they've got the two eyes, they've got the nose here, the mouth there. How is that evolutionarily possible on another planet? That the intelligent life form that came into being looks exactly like us. Impossible, right? Only one solution. They're humans. But they look so different. They've got spaceships and the thing and the stuff. So, uh, second solution to that, they're from the future. And then this goes into this whole kooky thing about why do you need a spaceship if you're doing time travel? But if you go back in time, you go back in time a uh, thousand years. Oh, if you go back in time twenty four hours, right? You walk through your front door. It's a time machine. You go. Uh, you go back in time twenty four hours. You won't be out front of your house twenty four hours ago. You'll be somewhere in the dark of space, at a point right. in space in which the planet's going to turn just so that your little doorway is going to be where you would be in that point in space in time. But yeah, you're out in the black. So if you did time travel, then you'd need a spaceship to go find Earth. You'd have to fly back to it. The next thing that's that's often reported is there's lots of probing that goes on. Mm-hmm. It just always seems like a weird sort of like, why are they sex probing people? Why are the aliens sex probing people? Right with the in the in the no no zone. Right? Why is that happening? And it makes absolutely no sense unless these time traveling future humans are microbiologists and they're getting <laughs> that microflora samples that are required in the future because somehow we've used too many antibiotics and they've all died off, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's my that's my alien Microfauna, theory. yeah. Yeah. My alien theory is they're just time traveling microbiologists coming back to get some microflora sample to take back and save the future. Okay, so this has been this week in science fiction. <laughs> That's, it sounds good. I'll buy it. It's good as well, anything is, else. What is science fiction anyway? What is science fiction anyway than the prediction it's, of science to come? Just like historical fiction. You take something that you know and you make something up from there. No, no, but historical fiction never comes true. Science fiction often well, does. Sometimes, yes. Often, often does. I mean, well, you, 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 like the classic example is the communicator on Star Trek. That's right. an outdated flip phone, right? <laughs> like, yep. it's like, who even uses a flip phone anymore? Didn't even have a, it wasn't even touch screen. It was a ridiculous piece of archaic technology. But when it was being presented in the 60s, it was futuristic. You could have a communication device that fits in the palm of your hand. It flips up. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like the uh, the House of Tomorrow in Disneyland, where they had everything that we have now. They basically had a microwave, they mm-hmm. had um, a cordless phone. That was a big deal, right? Mm-hmm. All these mm-hmm. things. But um, yeah, anywho, yeah, that science was just fiction. Deco. <laughs> it's Deco, exactly. And and there's another bit of science fiction that's about to come true. Well. A little bit more. We're getting a a new generation of. Solar technology is being developed that uh, can work in low light. And so far, basically, what they've got, it's the organic photovoltaic cells, OPV, third generation of solar technology offering exciting opportunities thanks to the potential for very cheap manufacturer, lightweight, low profile, and compatible with flexible substrates, which means they can be uh, put on portable electronic devices and the rest of it. Basically... A small photo cell that's you know smaller than a credit card that you could attach to a cell phone, a Kindle, a iPad mm-hmm. thing, and it could charge while you're inside on your couch using it. 
in your in your house in your house like it can operate in shade low light works even better outdoors but they say it's sufficient to be adding charge even indoors doesn't require yeah it doesn't require direct sunlight to, to operate that's really interesting it's kind of like um those calculators you had early in school not the graphing calculators the really simple ones that had the little photo cell on it and if you covered mm -hmm. it the numbers would go away yeah I was thinking <laughs> about that recently and about why we didn't have that on other things and uh, I guess maybe now we will that'll be awesome yeah that'd be sweet. pretty sweet and there's another story I don't think I've got that one here but they've been working on a uh, photo uh, photovoltaic, photovoltaic uh, system that can it's basically a clear film so you could put it like over a window or something like that. Uh, it can be gathering charge from the windows that you could still be looking at. And there was even another one that was finding ways of putting the processors in there so you could use something like a window as a touch screen computer and mm, not mm -hmm. have like, you know, wires and stuff. I have heard about that before. That's pretty cool. Those two combined, that's a whole new thing, right? Yeah. There's my the iPad is really just like a little projector. That's all you need. <laughs> Be great. Yeah. All right. Well, I have a couple things left. I don't know how much time we have left. Not a whole lot. Um, About an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I have no idea. Uh, would you like to hear about a slime mold that has an external memory or about right-handedness in animals? I want to hear both. Okay. All right. Well, I'll start with the animals. So we had thought originally that predominance to right-handedness and just handedness in general too was something that mostly just humans had and that they developed in the same parts of the brain as tool use and language which the tool use part makes sense to me I'm not sure exactly why they thought it was the same mechanism that came with language but I guess it was from brain scans that it looked like it was the same loci in the brain. So what they found was that in three different studies they found great apes to have predominantly right-handed uh, individuals, about 90 percent of their population, which is pretty similar hmm. to the number that we have. Hmm. And they basically this means that they're they're it's not looking like it's part of the same development that created language. Hmm. I definitely right. do think it has to do with tool use because you don't really need handedness if you don't have tool use. And what's really interesting is it was over five years this study. It was pretty extensive. They were looking at gorillas, chimpanzees, and children. <laughs> and Across the board, with inanimate objects, apes and children always, most of the time, use their right hand. When they were pointing or grabbing inanimate objects, right hand. When they're looking at animate objects, other animals, other members of their species, touching each other, grooming each other, there's no handedness. Hmm. But Interesting. It's the bottom brave line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bottom line, human right-handedness is not species-specific, but it's context-dependent. And so really, we just haven't been looking wow. for the right clues to find handedness in other animals, which means potentially we could find find handedness in other animals. I mean, we've found tool use in other animals. Is yeah, hoodness, hardness. <laughs> yeah, like no, I mean, I, I think, I think you could, like, if, uh, for instance, is, and I, you know, there's so many studies, right, where a an animal has to, you know, in research, use a paw to to tap on something to get the reward or whatever. I wonder if they ever looked at handedness or pawedness of that. Do rats tend to use their right paw when they're 
you know, doing a task. Do do horses tend to to stomp out <laughs> like the counting? I don't know. I'm thinking mm-hmm. like the the counting trick, right? <laughs> like the yeah, I think the horse always uses the same. Oh, for that, but I don't I'm know if it means right anything or if that's what's just just what they're trained, which one they're trained to use. But mm. um, interesting um, point is that um, they found that the left hemisphere of the brain specializes directing the right side of the body, which we knew before. But right. that basically means that um, a lot of our fine motor skills that we use for handedness is in the left side of our brain, which now I want to know more about left-handed people, if it's switched or not. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 right? I think which so. I don't know. I, I guess maybe I'd have to do um, some research of my own for that. But... I don't I'm know if they've looked into that before. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's the deal, but uh, that it switches sides. Well, yeah, no, that that that's yeah. What I about think, when you're ambidextrous? Know. What what about when you can use both? I don't I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. That's so weird to be in my dex, ambidextrous though. I mean, it's seen, not weird. I mean, I guess it's, I think it's weird that we're not. Really, when it comes down to it, it seems really strange yeah. to me that we have a lazy hand. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like driving an automatic. It just it's like yeah, you don't need your left leg anymore. <laughs> yeah, you just yeah, it just it doesn't need to use a clutch. You just just let your left leg just hang out there. Yeah, so. An even more interesting uh, link of the study, too, is remember I was saying that it's a similar locus in the brain for um, language development as well. And originally mm-hmm. they thought language came first and then the handedness, but now it looks like the other way. The handedness came first and then the language. But so they're looking now at the brain connections to the handedness in relation to language development. And so um, at the Swedish University, they're applying the same methodology that they did from this experiment to try to study children from birth to five years to look at language development. So they said, we want to see if the children who are more bilateral with their object manipulation skills, so they use both sides kind of equally, have a different pattern of language development than children who demonstrate more typically lateralized hand behaviors. If it turns out to be a pattern, then it could be a great diagnostic measure of clinicians for clinicians sneaking to identify children at risk of delayed or disrupted language development. So you can even look at as a child is developing what hands they're using to do things and be able to protect, predict and prevent language disorders is what they're trying to imply here, which seems like a pretty big leap to me, but I didn't do the brain scans, so I yeah. can't really say. Yeah, no, that's really fascinating. I think it would also, you'd be able to identify all the Italian kids. Because <laughs> oh, they talk with their hands. My da- my daughter's much more Italian than me. She she's constantly the hands are. That's true in Jewish culture too. We talk with our hands There's a lot. A whole lot of this going on now. It's very Mediterranean. <laughs> Do you have anything else? Uh, one last thing, and it's actually okay. very long. <laughs> so we're gonna go. Right. We might go slightly over. Right. Uh, but I kind of wanted to the sort of zip through this one, but uh, there was a a presidential commission for the Mm -hmm. study of bioethical issues that today released its report concerning genomics and privacy. In the report, Privacy and Progress in Whole Genome Sequencing concludes that to realize the enormous promise that whole genome sequencing holds for advancing clinical care and the greater public good, Individual interests and privacy must be respected and secured. As the scientific community works to bring the cost of the whole genome sequencing down from millions per test to less than the cost of many standard diagnostic tests today, the Commission recognizes that the whole genome sequencing and its increased use in research in the clinic could yield major advances in healthcare. However, it could raise some ethical dilemmas. Now, I did. Well, I didn't get this. I didn't understand at first. Like, what's an ethical? What's the ethical dilemma associated with sequencing a genome? Yes. Right. Like, I didn't. 
I'm glad this, uh, they got together and figured out some things, because some of this is actually kind of interesting, right? Um, let's see. Let me see if I can skip to uh, uh, skip to where where they were sort of pointing out some of the some of the snakes in the grass. Uh, let's see. One of the one of the things that was pointed out in here somewhere was there's no law in most states, at least I guess probably all of them, just about to prevent you from sequencing someone else's DNA. Mm. And, right, and like how do you determine whose DNA it is? So for instance, you could go, uh, you could go and have a sandwich, right, and uh, they could, you could, they, somebody could grab your fork at the end of it. Right. Right, after you've left, grab your fork, go have it sequenced. Or, well, or and that could be the, used against you too, because then they could sequence your DNA and see what your weaknesses are, exactly. and design a perfect poison. <laughs> they could, uh, or you say you're at work. Say, uh, you know, uh, you put down the coffee mug at work. You walk away. You come back. It's gone. Uh, I guess somebody picked it up. Shoot. Uh, but it's your boss, or it's the HR department, and they swab mm. it, and they're trying to determine if you're a health risk. You're. They want to make you partner at the law firm. But they're looking for somebody who's going to be there for 20 years, and oh, looks like there's a there's a, a couple of genes that indicate you're potentially at risk for heart disease, and then you get passed over for the promotion. Um, there could be there could be a, it's like sign up for the sign up for this uh, you know this free trip to Hawaii. All you have to do is sign up. There's no obligation to do anything whatsoever. They take the little pencil you wrote with throw it in the machine, sequences your DNA. Now they can mark it directly to your cannabis dependence, your alcohol dependence, your <laughs> potential susceptibility to gambling. Uh, you're, you know, all of a sudden you're receiving junk mail <laughs> or, or whatever it is. You're being direct marketed based on your DNA. I mean, there's a lot that actually uh, you could want to keep private in your genome. Of course, also, speaking of this week in science fiction, <laughs> in the back of my head I'm thinking, what if your boss took your coffee cup and made a clone mm, dun, and then dun, dun. fired you? <laughs> <laughs> I replaced you with the scab. yourself. <laughs> yeah. Do I still get paid? No, that's not how this works. <sighs> I just hired you at a tenth the price. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah, so I mean, these are things I hadn't. These are kind of things I hadn't even thought of. That, yeah, these are these are things the Supreme Court is going to have to deal with most likely, and yeah. and make laws about only you have the right to your own DNA, or um, you and your nest next of kin has the legal right to your own DNA. Like you're basically going to have to patent your own DNA. Right, and and, and it's really curious though because. Uh, in some states, your image uh, goes to your next of kin. In some, it does not. So if you were a, a celebrity, if you're a celebrity in Los Angeles and you die, your family gets the rights to whether or not they make T-shirts with your face on it. I think if you're in New York, uh, it, it doesn't exist. So anybody can run and, and make Blair hats. Right? But, mm -hmm. or, you know, it's, uh, so I wonder, like, how far removed is your gen gen uh, genetic sequence from your your image as property? Right? How do you do? You do you cease to own it when you die? Mm. Crazy! And you know what's stupid is that it's <laughs> gonna have to be decided by lawyers. It's gonna be law stuff. It's gonna be all these meaningless words that are gonna yeah. really. Take over it's gonna be to... like tax code. The, oh my goodness! The, the legal code for DNA is gonna be more complicated than the actual genetic code. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It'll probably have more lines attached to it than the, than the actual genetic sequence. <laughs> wow! Oh, crazy. Yeah. Well, I think we've done it. I think we've okay. done it once again. Do I you want to hear? Come... Wait. Oh, yeah. Do you no, want to yeah, hear yeah. about the slime mold first? Yeah, yeah, Real yeah, yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah. Give okay. Give me the slime. This is, this is a real quick one. Slime mold has spatial, quote unquote, 
memory for navigation. Slime molds, no huh? brain. They do right. not have a brain. There's not a brain there to speak of. They but... just, they don't even have really like organs. They're just a bunch of cells that are connected and they just kind of ooze around and mostly eat sugars, processed sugars. They don't even eat it because they don't have organs. It's not a fungus or a mold. It's a protist. And we've had trouble grouping it in a taxonomic group. It keeps it moving around. Regardless, they're these bizarre creatures do not have a normal nerve network because they're these own autonomous cells that are in a group. It's a very odd organism. But essentially, in um, lab tests, they took the slime mold and they put it in a petri dish far away from their food source, some uh, sugar, and uh, they let it find the sugar. And they had um, a U-shaped wall in the way. And it took a while, but the slime mold navigated around the wall to the sugar. Then they had them do it again. And what it turns out is that the slime mold leaves a chemical trail, kind of like Hansel and Gretel and the breadcrumbs, <laughs> to find its way where it's been before to get back to a food source. Wow. And the way they figured that out is they, they found this slime that the slime mold leaves behind, hence slime mold, and uh, they covered the entire Petri dish in it in some specimens, and they never found the sugar. Given 120 hours to find it, they never found the sugar when, um, when there was their chemical slime was everywhere. So hmm. only when it was left where they had been before, they were able to tell where to go and where not to go and get to the sugar quicker. Wow. Yep. Slime molds. So <laughs> intelligence isn't necessarily associated with intelligence anymore. With having a brain? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that really opens up the potential for uh, intelligent life on Earth. Mm. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's some slime molds on Mars we have, we're about to find. All right, thank you, everybody. The big shout-out to Blair and uh, the minions who are listening and to myself. Why not? Right. Yeah! I'd like to thank the Me Academy for making the buttons <laughs> go today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in the iTunes directory. Or if you have an Android device, you can search for Twist for Droid. That's Twist, the number four Droid app in the Android marketplace. And also it's Twist, T-W-I-S, in the iPhone market thingy. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, twist.org, www.twis.org. We also want to hear from you, so email us at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, justin at thisweekinscience.com. Also, my email is blairbaz at gmail.com. Or uh, twistminion at gmail.com because I oh, yeah. sometimes lose the password to the adjustment this week. <laughs> you can also, oh, be sure if you're doing uh, one of the thisweekinscience.com uh, emails, be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also contact us on the Twitter at Dr. Kiki, at Jacksonfly, at Blair's Menagerie, at Twiscience. Mm-hmm. We love your feedback. If there was a topic you would like us to cover, address a suggestion for an interview, a fashion tip, please let us mm -hmm. know. No fashion tips for me. I'm doing the show in pajamas till I get back to the United States. <laughs> we'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> and he goes
<sighs> I'm trying to sing the song in my head. <laughs> Identity for it? Probably yes. <laughs> I don't know. I would send it to Kiki, just in case. Yes, I slept two hours. Two. Maybe not even two. Close to two. But it's the equivalent of Saturday here because it's Friday. So I'm going to go back to sleep for a while. Yep. My commute is, uh, that's okay. It could be a lot better. It could be worse. Um, so there's buses that go straight to the zoo. But <laughs> they don't start running till the zoo opens after 10 o'clock in the morning. So uh, they, they instead I have to take a different bus and then I have to walk about 20, 30 minutes to work from there. But people keep giving me rides when they see me, which is very nice. Everyone's very nice. So it hasn't been too bad, but it's about an hour. Could be worse. I miss my car a little bit. I think I see a Jackson fly coming back. I also think I'm probably going to leave as soon as he gets back because I have to go to bed. Uh, no, I'm done with classes. I'm just working now, um, Sunday through Thursday. And, uh, yes, I, uh, I shifted the focus over to the roses for a minute because my uh, roommate, I didn't think she wanted to be on camera, so I changed, I moved the camera. <laughs> she ran in the kitchen for a second. No, I'm not an expert in Hebrew. I'm far from fluent. I understand about 10% of what people say, um, but I'm going to start studying on my own this weekend. <laughs> All right, Justin, I think I'm heading to bed. Oh, good night, Blair. Okay, I'm going to run away, but um, I'll, uh, I'll see you guys on the flip side next week. See you next week. Same science time, same science channel. Excellent. I'm leaving the hangout. All right. Bye. So what's up, uh, Twist Minions? So um, we have this uh, extended uh, time here. Yeah, because like, no, the person who's controlling the buttons isn't going to bed. The person controlling the buttons is wide awake. We're going to be flying into the midnight hour. Oh, wait, that's a ways from now. Uh, we're going to be flying towards the midnight hour. I look like I'm out of a 50s movie. <laughs> I, I, that's, that's very kind. Uh, I like 50s movies. Those are cool. But um, this was this, uh, out, this attire um, was at a department store. It was on an end cap. It was on a mannequin, right? And um, I, I saw it, and I'm like, oh, I want that. That's a cool sweater jacket thing. I like it. 
So I went looking for it. I'm going down the aisle. I'm looking around, looking around. It's nowhere. It's not anywhere. I'm, I'm with my five-year-old daughter at the time. And I decide, you know, I'm going to grab the one on the end cap. It's got the tags on everything. So I'm, I'm taking it off. <laughs> She's flipping out. She's like, Papa, Papa, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to buy this. This is, I'm going to take this. She's like, no, you, you can't. You can't buy it. You can't. I'm like, what, what do you mean I can't? She's like, it's, it's part of their display. I'm like, yeah, I know, but it's for sale. I mean, this, everything is, they're out of, this is the last one. I'm going to. So she thought we were getting away with like a high crime and misdemeanor the whole time. She was freaking out. So, uh, yeah, the lighting is kind of, this happened by accident uh, a couple weeks ago, and I liked it, so I left it. There's a painting over here that I was going to put up behind, um, and it's going to end up there at some point, but um, I'm kind of enjoying this glow thing. Well, I kind of want to tweak this a little so we get the, uh, somewhere in there, I can get uh, right about there, I think that's it, yeah. So hang on, I'm going to... Um, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, there is a Facebook page that's getting... Is it not live yet? Can we make it live? I don't know why we're... I think it's been unlive for a while so we could fix it up. But it's already... Those who sort of previewed it are already checking it out. So I'm kind of thinking... I'm kind of thinking we should just go ahead and make it go. Let's see. Is uh, I don't know if Ed is Ed is Ed in there? Ed Ed, are you in there? Are you in there? I don't think he is. Uh, but there's a Facebook page that's been uh, getting worked on a little bit for Science Island, where people are throwing up the things that they would like. To, well, nobody's throwing up, but they're they're suggesting ideas for what they would like to see on Science Island. Let's see. I don't know if, maybe, I, I think I'm an administrator thingy on this. Maybe I could make it live. Oh, where's the make it live button? Do I have a power, power to make a page with videos and chat all in one? And link? Uh, I don't, Zachary, I don't have any kind of computering abilities whatsoever. To me, computers are made up uh, one part Voodoo, another part, make me up science fiction. I'm I'm surprised that they even exist. Hot Rod, swing set for Science Island? Absolutely. In fact, I want a really super tall swing. Not like not like a like a one of those bounce like bungee swing things, not like a extreme swing. But just something that's I'm sort of picturing like telephone poles with the thing on the top and the standard kind of like swing, so you could just really be flying. Put it out on a little hill or something, and just you know, oh, it'd be awesome. So yeah, giant swing will definitely be part of Science Island. Also, bocce ball courts. Cause, I, don't know, I think those are cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, find it. Find a Minecraft geek to make Science Island. Actually, I already have one. My nine-year-old is deep into the Minecraft. He's already developed some stuff for Science Island on it. He's way into it. Uh, a second life. Does Second Life still exist? I, I mean, I remember hearing about that so long ago. I never like checked it out. Um, second Life. See, but the the problem with like with doing everything on Second Life or uh, Minecraft, I think Minecraft is actually like a great. <laughs> it's a great architect uh, modeling tool. I think you can really play with. Uh, you can really play with some sort of designing elements of of the terraforming, and it's perfect because my ideal setup uh, for the science island would actually be a, a a a sort of gentle sloping hill with a southern exposure. It's really broad. It doesn't have to be that tall, that high of a of a hill. It doesn't have to be a mountain, right? Uh, but a nice gentle slope. With, I'm sort of picturing a row of earth ships along the top, terraced garden, another row of earth ships, another terraced garden, like sort of just terraforming. Definitely have to have a bulldozer. That's the absolute first thing I would bring to Science Island is a bulldozer to, to do some terraforming. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely, Twit Refugee. Uh, 
once once we get the location, we could we could represent it in Minecraft and and actually plan out where things would go. We could build the model for it there, right? Absolutely. But so far, uh, Science Island is as as. Uh, let, me, let me see what some of our. We've talked a lot about the brewery. <laughs> So I guess people can ask to join it. So it must be up and running. Um, let's see. There's 29 members right now. Somebody just asked to join. Ah, where did they go? I don't know how to. I don't know how to add people though. Oh no, that's not good. I need to be able to add these people. Maybe somebody else is already on it. Maybe they already got them in there. Mm. Uh, Mark Webb, if you, if I didn't uh, join you, I'm sorry. I don't know where the button is. Mm. Mm. Let's see where else we got. Uh, and Dyer. oh, there he is. Floors. Uh, floors open. What kinds of research and experiments you want to see on Science Island currently? Which is, after all, all about science. Reinventing tools we use and the processes we use using sustainable materials and methods. I, I like the idea of making things very sustainable, eco-friendly, that sort of thing. It's not the only focus. Um, there, would be a, there would be a big emphasis on being off-grid as much as possible, mostly because I want to put this someplace rural. I want Science Island to be someplace where it creates a community of people who don't have um, uh, neighbors that aren't sciencey minded <laughs> people that you'd want to hang out and have a beer and fun conversation with. <laughs> I want like the whole neighborhood to be people who like to you know talk about sciencey things. But I also picture it as a as a resort, like it's a place you could move to and build your thing. But it it also be like. We'd have events where we invited general public to come and hear speakers talk on sciencey themed subjects for a weekend, uh, and do solar saunas and bocce ball courts and the giant swing. And the beer is going to be awesome. We're going to have a, our own brewery, which is going to be a huge, uh, huge hit. That's like one of the most, <laughs> most universally, unanimously suggested things that Science Island must have a brewery. I don't know how you joined. Uh, well, yeah, well, I could just put the link. Oh, man. Jeez. Sometimes. Here we go. Here we go. There's that. Hit the button. There we go. So that's the link to uh, just uh, get in on the ground floor of the, the Sciencey Island discussions. I really, I, I'm, I know it's because I'm a Californian. I want it to be in California. I like Northern California. There's big swaths of beautiful, uh, beautiful Northern California that go for really cheap still. That would be perfect. They have plenty of rainfall, which we're going to be collecting and using to grow crops year round and be drought proof because we're going to collect rain from the sky and keep it. Off grid with the water, off grid with sewage, off grid with electricity. I don't want to be off grid with <laughs> with internet though, so that's that's a big challenge. Got to figure out if you can use. You got to figure out if it's possible to get a decent internet connection using plastic optical <laughs> and running it to the nearest uh, junction, which would be really far away. But plastic would be the the only reasonably affordable way. Uh, I don't oh Facebook page public because you don't have an account. Twit refugee, why don't you have a Facebook account? You don't even have a fake one to spy on ex girlfriends. Like, what are you doing? Okay, so um, I don't know how to make it public. As there's probably a managerial backdoor something button somewhere, but I don't see it. Uh, let's see. Da, da, da. Science, uh, da, da, da. And yeah, I don't know how to do it. Oh wait, what's this? Ooh, it's a settings button. No, it's just to send a message. 
Mm -hmm. Is it under this? No. Ooh. It's still locked. Oh. Hang on. Maybe I can. No. I don't have the. Apparently, I don't have the ability to unclose the group. I'm hitting the little locked symbol, and I can't seem to do it. But uh, that'll get. We'll get that sorted out. Uh, hopefully, next week we'll we'll be able to get everybody viewing it. Everybody aboard. Oh, here we go. There we go. Now I'm seeing. There we go. Got a few more, few more people aboard Science Island. Mooncat, you don't have Facebook either, really? I thought everybody. Oh, building your own satellite. Oh, I don't. It got taken apart. I had a satellite. Yeah, I don't know where it is now. Uh, I had one of those little cube sets. Actually, my uh, my nine year old put it together. He assembled it. It's a little thing, but you need a really, you need a lot of them up there, and then yeah, it's complicated. And that's not gonna be, wouldn't be that good. We'd be running it through ham radios, and it's just it's silly complicated. There could be an intranet that was completely kick ass, which you know, as long as we're ac accessing data that's been <laughs> archived at Science Island, we could have super fast internet connections to it. We could have intramural video gaming going on. Um, we could have all the dwellings wired. To each other and to a you know central database or whatever server locally. Uh, yeah, there is there are microwave links. I mean, they're and actually in that region they're somewhat popular because it's a rural area and it's sort of been discovered that yeah you can beam internet through the airwaves pretty decently. I've seen I've seen that in a couple places. It has issues with. Has issues with uh, if you're in one building, you got it, and then the next building behind it, you don't, and weird stuff like that. But we could figure all that out. I know if we don't have the net, uh, look, if we don't have the bandwidth to get Netflix, then it's not going to work. So we're going to get bandwidth. We'll figure that out. Um, some of the, you know, worst case scenario is we should be able to, I think, run a DSL, right? Right, like lines out cables to some juncture because it's got to be running from one place to another and if there's a highway nearby anywhere probably not too far from phone lines there's got to be a way yeah we will we will <laughs> make our own Netflix well a media center would absolutely be a core of it because this is science island would be a place to live a science -y friendly community right eco-friendly and all that kind of stuff grow food a little bit of farming going on eggs whatever yeah be able to live off the land, but but not in that really Amish way, in the, like, turn the lights on, <laughs> have electronics, big screen TV, still. I think we can still do those things. Another thing would be the uh, the resort and event place. We could invite uh, bands to play there. We could invite, uh, you know, seminars and this, that, and the other, uh, lectures, speakers, invite the public to come and rent earthships or yurts or whatever, and, you know... Um, Make some money for upgrades to the island that way, uh, and and then the other, the other would be uh, actually having some science done there. That would be pretty cool. But it would also be a center for propaganda, <laughs> pro science propaganda think tank. Every every member of Science Island is part of the think tank, and so if you get together and think tank through issues, through solutions, through things that we would like to see change in the world, what problems are on the outside world, in the outside world, of course. And have a very, and create media that is pro-science, it's basically propaganda. And you pub, pro, propaganda, public relations, it's the same, with the different words for the same thing. It would be very, yeah, it would be very uh, TED Talk-like. We would have a theater... I'm picturing a hay bale structure octagon when the interior has like carpeted riser thing. It's very, I have a very 70s nostalgia for this room. It seems like some place that Carl Sagan would have spoken at a university in Colorado. I don't know why that's the picture, but you know, um, turtlenecks are required for some of the get togethers. 
<laughs> Ministry of Information. Institute of Reason. The let's see, science. We'd also need, you know, potentially we would need. Um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, security for the island, which would be the Science Island Safety Security Intelligence, or Sissy. <laughs> We'd have if you if you wanted to protect the island, you had to become a sissy. <laughs> and <laughs> cords and polyester shirts. Polyester shirts. I actually have a few. I have quite a good. Yeah, they used to have a very nice collection of polyester shirts. It's shrunk over the years. Not the shirts. No, they didn't shrink. They're actually fine, but the collection is smaller than it used to be. The, the, only, the, the biggest problem with California is those building permits are insane. It's insanely expensive to build anything. Earth ships aren't allowed here yet. Um... I feel like, though, with enough people, the will to do it, you can have the potential to lobby some rural area that doesn't have land that's being used for income or any other purpose to allow experimental buildings for research on dwelling, living in those dwellings. There's got to be some way we can, <clears throat> some way we can put it together where. The actual island itself is part of an experiment, sort of like the biodome, right? Uh, you probably couldn't get a permit to build the biodome, um, but if you call it science and, you know, work out what research you're doing by living there, you could probably do it. Will it be a gated community? Uh, no. Um, <clears throat> there, won't be, there won't be a gate. Um, because gates gates aren't really that effective. What we need is a moat, uh, a very large moat surrounding the. Uh, no, there won't be a moat. But <clears throat> that's a good question. Will it be well. It depends on how big it is, Hot Rod. If it's really honestly, if we if we're putting this uh, near near the uh, populated areas, then I think yeah. I think you you might want to have it walled off like a big compound or like you know Science Island is separated from the community by those walls I guess uh, you know um, yeah Oregon Oregon has some places that could actually work pretty well um, Oregon has some some green building zones where they're a lot less uh, strict than California about what and where you can build um, the but the idea, the idea too, is that if we're just real world, it sort of depends on where it ends up. Some of these locations I've been looking at that I'm most excited about are like 300 plus acres, um, 200 to 300 acres of land, which would be pretty impractical to actually wall off the whole area. Although, although there are some good reasons for doing it um, rurally, because you could have things like deer. Coming through and eating your garden be really annoying, right? And then, and then, too, it can't be too, too rural because, you know, Science Island is a great place to live and, you know, be sustainable and everything, but a lot of people need to have their jobs in the outside world. Uh, as virtual as possible, yeah, but we also want to be able to, like, have you know, people breadwinning for their family in the traditional sense out in the other world. We're not escaping completely America. We're still part of America. We're just going to be living differently as Americans than the suburban sprawl sort of set up. Right, telecommute makes sense, but then telecommute gets a lot harder if we don't have the decent uh, internet. So there's obstacles, there's problems, there's issues, there's things that need to be resolved and overcome to make Science Island a reality. Um, first of which is we got to raise the money for the land and a bulldozer. <laughs> those, those are like the two, the two. Well, actually, the land and then 
figure out a place that will let us put it there. And that might actually even be the first the first step. Realistically, you know, no no sense raising money to buy land in a place that's not going to let you do the kind of building or build that that uh, community, right? But that's what the uh, I guess the Science Island page itself is going to be a, a good a good start for collecting collecting folks with an interest in things like this. Hmm. An internet engineer to build a colo and internet node. Which could mean something really important, but I don't know what that is, Twit Refugee. What's a colo internet interweb node? Hmm. Isn't the node like the space between nerves that the impulses have to the electric impulses have to jump across that slows down the speed at which your nerves are Fine. Yeah, I'm sure there's not. I don't think there's such a thing as a burnt out billionaire, Mark. I think if I had a billionaire, if I had a billion dollars in the bank, I'd be pretty, pretty excited every day. Every day I'd wake up and just be like, "Oh yeah, I'm a billionaire! Woo! Time to get out of bed, go and rent a hot air balloon, throw water balloons at poor people." That's how I would roll. But you Twit Refugee, I, I I absolutely think that you should create a Minecraft server dedicated to Science Island. I think that's brilliant. Build a giant uh, a, a big giant berm hill, like a foothill kind of a thing, with a nice southern facing. Right? And start playing with the water, because that's actually a big part of it too, right? Um I don't, well, I think they have everything in Minecraft now, but it's one of the things that uh, I've been fixated on for a while is figuring out the water collection. Um, how to collect enough water so that you don't have to conserve. Because this is my thing, too, is I'm not trying to... I don't want to, to make do with less <laughs> of anything, ever. And I think part of the point of Science Island should be Here's how you can exist off-grid, independent from the system, and use resources to your heart's content without, um, without doing it in a typical way. Part of that is rainwater. Rainwater is so huge, especially a place that's got decent. Northern California, Oregon has fantastic water uh, resources in the way of rain. You know, if you can collect an area that gets six inches of rain a year, you know, that's a good, you know, and you have an area of a couple football fields that you can collect the drainage from, you know, all of a sudden you're talking about a very tremendous volume of water that you can, you can store and use whenever you want. A river for a hydro dam. <laughs> I don't know if we can get a river to build a hydro dam. However, however, that is kind of interesting. Um, I kind of wonder if the, you know the other things to, to think about. But there's areas like Benicia, um, which I, I don't think I could stand living in, honestly. But the trees there are all pretty much sideways. They grow, you know, like a like a 60 degree angle like out uh, towards the towards the east because the wind coming from the west is just constant and unrelenting there's and there's a, they've started putting wind farms and all the rest up in the hills around there because of it but uh, finding something like that that is a natural resource for energy that's constantly going to be there is uh, that would be a good plan <laughs> to it refugee really wants a moat Really, like, you gotta have a moat. Hot Rod, I, I, yeah, my experience with Minecraft was that 
I would make a tunnel, and then an hour later, I could make another tunnel. And but watching my nine-year-old, he construct he can construct a castle with like working moving parts and flowing water and all these weird mechanisms. Creates machinery, does all this stuff, and he just he does it in in minutes. I mean, it's just crazy. Once once you get uh, deep within the Minecraft thing, all kinds of crazy things are possible. Well, yeah, uh, Ed, yeah, Ed, that's right. Yeah, if there was a good virtual science island, it could uh, it could actually be a fantastic publicity tool, right? Yeah. Look at this. We got more. Oh, wow. So, oh, we gained like, uh, was that four or five members of Science Island? Six members? Hmm. Okay. Up to 34 members. Nice. We are growing. Population cap is about 150. I think to start, I think if you started with more than 150 people, you'd already start with factions. I think about, I think 150 is sort of the ideal tribal size of the community. Anything too much bigger than that, and then it starts to, you know, it's just to start with, you know, but it's kind of weird too. Like, I've already been thinking in a very, early pilgrim sort of way about the dynamic of having a small group of people rebuilding a society in their own image, right? founding fathers sort of a thing. Um, it's really fascinating to think about a society, America, starting that way, or any, any society, any country, any nation, any people starting as this really small group that decided to, to build. Because at first, your neighbors are your neighbors. You know everybody. They're your, your friends. They become your family. Uh, over years, you you know, lots of, it's a lot of family. It's the person who makes the food also comes to, you know, who prepares your food all, at the cafe, also visits you at the pub, and you guys work together in the field, or whatever. Like, it all becomes all this... It's very integrated and sort of intimate in that sort of way. And then you look at a society like now, like a giant city, and it's just, people are anonymous, and there's crime, and there's all this stuff that happens. And you're like, how does, how does that happen? Because all that sort of thing would be so against the community. Like, who would do vandalism in a small, tight community? It wouldn't make any sense. It would be ridiculous, right? Huge source of hot air right here. I'm good. You got it. <laughs> Whatever you need. <laughs> Connect the host to the dome of the Capitol building. Unlimited hot air. Nice. See, too, the it is, uh, democracy th thing too is I think pretty, you know, pretty unwieldy. Sort of a thing when you get to a large population because, like, in the United States of America has what? Creeping up on 400 million people? Are we, are we more than that now? We're like 400 million something people, whatever. How can you know every. There, there's just too many issues. <laughs> like, there's too much stuff. Like, some people might be urban planning. How is urban planning going to make it into a national election is, a, is an issue. How is, you know, how is, how, how do all these 380 million people, thank you, how do 380 million people come up with, you know, how do we end up with like a dozen issues <laughs> at election time? It's ridiculous. It's totally, it's not representative anymore. On a much more local uh, level, democracy has, uh, has a much different feel to it, you know. Uh, it's it's much more intimate. It much more affects your daily life, and the results you can produce, I think, are 
you know, I don't know. Maybe it's no better. Maybe it's maybe it turns into utter chaos and revolution day two. <laughs> Science Island. <laughs> it gets totally overthrown and religion is declared. Like who knows <laughs> what could happen? Yeah, um yeah, you know, space bats so a place where you can declare a separate country and have your own laws. You actually can in a community. Every community ultimately de defines which laws exist within the community because they're either whatever the national laws, or it's either enforced or it's not. Great example, well, to an extent. Good example is what's going on in Oakland right now. Uh, they, Cal State of California, legalized marijuana for medicinal use, uh, which then opened up the door for legal businesses to produce marijuana and sell it to the public. A uh, very large facility was opened in Oakland and they they were you know in doing business they're producing three million dollars a year in tax revenue for the city of Oakland. They got shut down by the feds, the federal government. The city of Oakland is suing the federal government to reinstate that business. Partly because they enjoyed the revenue flow from it, it was helping improve the community, but also because here in California it is legal. So there, there can be conflicts like that, but, but when you're in a, uh, a small community where your general population is your, you know, where your authority figure is your neighbor, and your community at large is the authority, right? Uh, the laws of outside the community don't mean nothing, really. It could be, yeah, a floating ship like a, oh, there was, oh, gosh, this was a while back, but there was some sort of um, floating city that they were going to start. Not the, not like the Facebook, like, cruise ship one, but there was another one that was being worked on at some point, like a floaty island of of freedom floating stuff. I don't know. And, and, and technically, I wouldn't want to be on an island island. I keep calling it Science Island, but I, I don't think I would want to be at sea anywhere. I don't want to, I don't want to have to like, I don't want to have to be like a five day boat trip like, away from so civilization. I don't like, I don't want to be out in the ocean getting tsunamied. I want to actually be with some elevation. And islands make me nervous because they're all like volcanoes or kind of like on fault lines. Like they, there isn't a safe island out there, I don't think. Uh, you, you, I mean, basically, uh, yeah, the island would be our civilization. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we could we could surround it by water. Refugee <laughs> still really wants the moat. Uh, but but it's also you know I'm looking for to bring all the technology there, and I think it's easier to do that in the construct of doing it within the borders of one of the greatest superpowers ever to be on the planet. Yeah. If you get to a point where you own the land, and uh, yeah, science oasis is is very good. Yeah, uh, we own the land, and your home doesn't have rent, right? Can you imagine that? Not ever paying rent or mortgage? The community gathers together, builds homes together. That's where you live. You don't pay rent. Your electricity is free. Your water is free. The, the idea partly is freeing up the finances also of people who move to Science Island. So you can have a job outside of Science Island all you want. You can make the outside world money. Uh, and you won't be paying for your you won't be paying thousands of dollars a month for a gypsum board uh, <laughs> um, two by four construct house that can't keep the energy inside of the heat or the cool within its 
walls that you're pumping through. And like, here's, I mean, you don't even have to pay for an air conditioner. The air conditioners should be free. Nobody should be paying for that. Air, a proper air conditioning system does not require electricity. It requires somebody digging a 30-foot, 40-foot trench, running a, a, a tube down it. You got one end that pops up to bring air in. The other end goes into the ventilation system of the house. You pop open the skylight. The heat in the house rises out of the skylight, pulls air through that pipe. In that trench, if you put it about six feet down, the temperature is a constant 59 degrees. So by opening a skylight, you're bringing 59 degree weather into the vents of the house. You cool it down. No electricity. This is just how... This is just basic sciencey goodness right here. I mean, this is just this. I mean, this is just how the hot air rises. It brings it through the tube. There you go. You've cooled the house. No electricity. No, <laughs> no compressor cranking on and off, drowning out the conversation. Uh, so yeah, partly it's a it's a science oasis. I I mean, here here if I, my dream is to own my own Earth ship. But I would, just for reference too, I'm a little, I would name it Vault 13. I'm calling dibs on that. My, my address is going to be Vault 13 on the island. So there's a little, there's a little uh, homage to the, to the fallout. No, you don't. Uh, well... Do you need energy to move water through pipes? Yeah, um, but I'm not talking about the, that pipe that's in the air, uh, in the ground. Isn't a water pipe? That's uh, that's just air. That's just air flowing. Uh, the air would flow through the the pipe that's six feet down, and it would get cooled on the way to being pulled through the house. Uh, you do need electricity. I wouldn't do without electricity. I love electricity. Electricity is awesome. But we'd produce it: solar panels, wind. Uh, small, um, <clears throat> discrete nuclear generator. We, we, we'll, we'll have a little bit of we'll have a little bit of everything on Science Island. Yeah, we would. You know, a lot of the the way I would. That's part, partly why I want the big slope with the terraced gardens on the way down is because you could use gravity to move a lot of the water. Um, you wouldn't have to have everything pumped and piped uh, that way. You could just have it. I mean, you need a pipe. You wouldn't need it uh, electrically pumped places. Although I have one or two, like there's like inline pipes that I think you could create a really Gilligan's Island type thing where you get somebody on an exercise bike to, <laughs> to run the water, but it's totally unnecessary. Well, no, we okay, Twit Refugee. We we don't have to fabricate everything ourselves. I think there's. Uh, there's certain things that it makes sense to because you can do it cheaper than you can buy it and if you have a lot of smart people why not you know do it yourself it you know uh, but on the other hand like there's other things that I don't think science on I mean I'm not I don't want to start from scratch there's gonna be a little of that there's gonna be a little evolution of society as part of the experiment of science island which is I sort of picture the the first the first uh, the first experience there will be setting up a bunch of yurts, right? Like you, you, it's going to be hard to start right with you know or tents. I guess people could tent live for a while. You could set up a couple of yurts for some bigger living, uh, some solar showers, that sort of thing. Get the basics in there. Probably start with outhouses. Wouldn't be anything. Or, or you could do you could start with the first solar uh, septic tanks. I guess you could start with that pretty quick, but you, it would be—it wouldn't be that independent at first. It would be very primitive, very tribal-looking, and then you would grow it and build it beyond that. And so there were, and then you get the earth ships, and then you get some, uh, you know, um, uh, some more architecturally advanced uh, buildings in there. You know, you, you could keep you could keep progressing that portion of it, but I, I think at some point we would have a nuclear reactor. I think that would have to go without saying. Uh, 
No, we wouldn't have to have our own uranium enrichment facilities. But, may, okay, so say we did, though. I mean, if you did it on a small scale, I mean, if you're only powering, like, 150 homes, like, how much plutonium do you really need to score on the black market? Is it that much? I don't know. Yeah. And, and, and Rox, I, I actually don't think... I think the best plan would be to have electricity from the outside grid. And this is going to be one of those contention issues where are we really independent if we don't have outside, if we're relying on outside grid? And, and I, I sort of picture it as, you know, if you put solar panels on, your, on the roof of your house that can feed the grid when it's daytime and you don't have the lights on and power's at its peak and it's feeding the grid all day. And then night comes and instead of relying on batteries that have been charged up by your solar panels, you just use the grid power that's attached to your pg e your public utility or whatever it is, right? And you can have energy independence that way without having to do the battery thing, to have to do the storage and hope it wasn't cloudy that day, or you know, you go on vacation for two weeks during the summer, Keep the solar panels are producing energy that whole time, feeding the grid. You haven't used anything. Uh, come that winter, it's cloudy for, you know, completely overcast for a couple weeks, and you've used nothing but the grid's technology. It could all balance out in the big scope of picture of things, right? Right. Right, Ed from Connecticut. Start with uh, grid connection. As technology improves, solar panels become more efficient. We can get further and further off the grid. I actually think one of the one of the interesting ideas would be to become a power company. To to erect enough solar panels that we actually become a municipal uh, power provider. There's a couple ways of doing this, but one of the one of the interesting ideas uh, could be uh, inviting being able to create. Okay, so, so this is fun. So you become you become a like consumer reports kind of a organization for the solar power industry. You bring in a couple of engineers and experts who are living on the island, and basically what they do is they're monitoring. Uh, how different panels made by different manufacturers are producing. Uh, they, who's producing more when it's cloudy? Who's producing more over the year in total? Who's got a greater output of, of energy during the sunnier times? Whatever it is. And you get donations of, of uh, panels from different companies to erect and test in the field. And if you do it, if you do it on a large enough scale, suddenly you've got a municipal power plant as well, and you're producing energy more than the community can even use. And if we do grab something like that 300-acre plot, uh, there's a lot of room to do that with. Oh yeah, and the algae to produce biodiesel to run the bulldozer. <laughs> Absolutely. And, I, and, you know, there's got to be some room for experimentation. I still have this project. I still have this idea that algae can be used as a solar panel. Like, and, and there's been some experimentation in this out there, but what a wonderful uh, symbiotic, self-sustaining thing it would be to have a, a far-off wastewater pond that is where the waste is being devoured by algae and the algae are converting that into free electrons, which are going through a uh, one-way membrane and being collected as a, as a uh, power generator. Can we... Can... <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know who would fund this. You know, I think the first thing is land. Everything else sounds like sweat. <laughs> like sweat hours. We need people to... I love I love digging in the dirt, so I'll dig the ditches. I'll run the bulldozer. I'll do all that stuff. Uh, we do we do need lawyers. Yes, I know. We do need lawyers. We need good lawyers. We need people who can get uh, or scientists who can figure out ways around building permits and that sort of thing. Yeah, photo. Uh, thank goodness for the 
the Chinese, right? Photoelectric panels are dropping in price. Efficiency is rising. Uh, it's getting it's getting much closer to the point when we can do that. And also, you know, there's a lot of alternatives for if you build if you build a home that you don't have heat or cool. It reduces the amount of electricity you have tremendously. You know. Uh, that you have to use. Uh, there's some other stuff too. As a society, you know, if we're not, if we don't have street lights everywhere, but instead we install solar lights, yeah, they'll be out by midnight. But then they also won't ruin the, there won't be the, the light pollution. So at night there'll be stars. And it's amazing how much you can see by starlight if it's not blocked out. Yeah, I know. Space bats, the volcanic island. You know, the geothermal energy just comes with such a high price. I don't know. Uh, no, we have Yosemite. Yosemite isn't Yosemite a super? Yosemite is a super volcano, isn't it? Or is that just Yellowstone? Do I have those? I probably have those con confused. Oh, the, the high price of, of geothermal being living on a volcano. I mean, it's got a trade-off, big trade-off. Big trade-off. And there's different ways, too, to be uh, energy efficient. Like, I keep thinking Earthship just because that's my deal. Some people might want to be more rusticy, tribally yurt oriented. There's also um, tiny homes. People have been getting really into tiny homes. There's one called a, uh, Z Glass House. I don't have a link to it anymore. It'll take me forever to find it. It's a tiny house that looks awesome. I don't know how efficient it is, but it's like a. You know, probably a 380 square foot house. So it's really small, but being really small means it's pretty cheap to heat and cool. Yada yada. Electric generation and hot water is. Uh, oh yeah, and yeah, they, yeah, that's the other thing. Fuel cell technology. You know, within the next <laughs> 50 years. Is going to be, yeah that could that could revolution revolutionize energy so that rural isn't energy deficient at all anymore and all bets are off we don't even have to worry about it yeah most Pacific Ocean Islands there it's all volcanoes it's it's all volcanic and and uh, earthquakey and tsunami I want hills I want mountains I want a I want a nice view. At an altitude that when global warming floods everything <laughs> up here, <laughs> future future uh, beachfront property. Where is that Z house? So let me see if I can find that. That's a pretty rad looking house. Z house, Z glass house. What is it called? No, it's not glass house. That can't be it. Uh, oh yeah, that is called that. All right. I think it's a. I don't know why I really like this, but I do. Let's see where is. Uh, yeah, just Google Z glass house. It's showing up in lots of different places. Hang on. This is the one. I can't see. Yeah, this. Oh, this is it. This is it. It's a tumbleweed house. It is. Okay, here it is. I got. It. So we probably already got posted there, right? Oops. No, I don't want an email update thing. Don't spam my arg. There it is.
hydrogen power plant. Damn, okay, so that might be more reasonable than me wanting a nuclear reactor. It, uh, and it's probably, <laughs> probably much, legally much more feasible than, um, and, and, and will interfere less with the neutron detector. So, I think that, uh, But you know, I mean, Northern California, we got the. There's got to be some not too inaccessible geothermal. Like, how far down do you have to drill anyway? Right? That's got to be possible. We just we could just do an endless drilling operation, but we're not looking for oil. We're not looking for water with it. We're just trying to get. We're just trying to get some heat, man. Really? We have to go all the way down to the mantle? Mm. Well, wait, there's got to be, the, like, what? The, we can go a little, like, more, is it Pelusa County? Where's Mount St. Helens? Or the, uh, no, Calistoga. Where they have, like, the, the thermal vents? Is that not, that wouldn't help? I don't know. I, ever, I really haven't looked in enough to the geothermal thing. It sounds like a good idea, but I've only seen people talk about it in Australia, which makes me think you have to be in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> like they're further down, they're closer to the to the interior of the Earth somehow. Mount Saint. No, we've got we've got some kind of yeah. It's all the way in Washington. You're right. No, what was I thinking? But no, Calistoga. It's oh uh, Saint Helena. That's a town. That's why. Um, near Calistoga. I think they've got like the hot springs and the stuff. I don't know. But but uh good source of water, shelter. These are but these are the basics. This is just like these are the things that we can we can I think knock out pretty logically pretty quickly. Um the next, the next steps are going to be the big ones. Inviting really sciencey people to, to do sciencey things. We want an observatory, which is tough because, like, you can, basically, for an observatory, a proper one, you need to have a really high elevation with no rainfall. And we want rainfall because we need to use the water to grow things. Um, with a radio telescope, maybe we can figure out something where we can turn a large area into a to a radio telescope, take some images of the, of the heavens above. Or we go all physics on it and just have people working on whiteboards doing math. It's also something possible. Hot springs. Hot springs would be nice. It'd be, it'd be fantastic to, right? Because then we've got like hot tub. We got like a a, a year round hot tub scene going where we don't have to worry about it. Can you build build big telescopes? You can you can uh oh can you use big telescopes remotely? Do you mean like get time uh, on like a Chilean telescope and use it from your home computer? I almost don't see why not. Right? Like why do the scientists actually have to go? to the observatory, unless they're just off-grid and not connected. Like, a lot of the scientists working at CERN aren't in, you know, they're just in the States. They're, like, down in Irvine or wherever, or, you know, West Covina, whatever that is. You know, they're, they're not actually on site. They're just high-speed connected to the data coming out so they can analyze it quickly. Well, we could, you know, I, I think instead of getting a satellite given to us, having one given to us, shouldn't we, I mean, if we bring in true brainiacs, shouldn't we just be able to hack one? <laughs> like, shouldn't we, I mean, this backdoors to everything, right? Come on. So, yeah, start with the basic technology, scale up, build bigger. Start with bulldozers and a brewery. Right? I think if we start with a bulldozer and a brewery, Everything else will fall into place. Everything else will be. 
Yeah, tough, harsh winters in Iceland. Uh, but they have a lot of hot springs, don't they? Ooh. Oh, you know what the best rocket launch pad is? It's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, from hot air balloons. So if you want to put stuff into space, no problem. We just need hot, hot air balloons. They can go up to like 80,000 feet, and then launching a rocket the rest of the way up into space is easy. You can do it with like fireworks, right? You can, you can put a bottle rocket in orbit at that point. You wait. You're leaving me for coast to coast. A oh wait, coast to coast AM. Oh, that's on it. Okay. All right, minions. Until next week, we'll uh, we'll reconvene. Uh, hopefully, everybody found Science Island. And hopefully, we can make it more publicy. Although the membership thing's kind of cool. It's like you're part of a secret page society. Oh, we need a secret handshake. Um, somebody should work on that. I'm not really good with the handshake thing. <laughs> Start with the brewery and we may not get any further. You know, um, if, if the entire community just wants to work on a brewery and make an, a really nice brewery, we, we could just do that. <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad idea, right? Uh, Twit Refugee, get a Facebook account. You don't have to put your, your right information. Just have a make it up one. Just make a, uh, 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 you can make a Facebook page that says Twit Refugee, and nobody would know it's you, except for us. All right. Do we wait? You know what? Do we need? Does it, does it, okay. Does everybody, I'm just assuming things. Does everybody know what an Earth ship is? What I've been talking about with that? Real email address. What's a real email address? Go to Google, go to Gmail, get a make it up email address. It's that easy. You use that as the email address to start up your make it up name on Facebook. I think you know, half the people on. on uh, on Facebook, aren't even people probably. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up an Earth ship and see uh, if I can find. You could just Google it and look at the pictures there, but here's here's kind of what that's all about. <clears throat> we may be we may do some of our best thinking in the pub. I think that this is very possible. A lot of a lot of really ambitious ideas could <laughs> could come together <laughs> at the pub. See what I was thinking is if we had a roller coaster, we, we wouldn't need to walk around the island anymore. You get on the roller coaster and just <laughs> monorail. Yeah, monorail. That's what we need. We could build a monorail. It's okay, Twit Refugee. You're not missing anything on Facebook, really, except for Science Island. We're missing. We're we're missing you. We're missing you, Twit Refugee. Facebook is worse off. At least Science Island Facebook page is worse off without your presence. Monorail, monorail. Kelseyville's got one. Monorail. I think it, I think we do need a monorail. We'll have to figure that out. How hard can a monorail be? It's been around for a while. We've had this technology. We can duplicate it. Right. <laughs> bulldozer, uh, bulldozer in the brewery. Things will be falling all right. And, uh, it's, once you've had a couple of beers and you get behind the wheel of a bulldozer, you'll find that uh, anything is possible. You'll, you'll be able to move mountains. Yeah, You know what? Monorail looks science is actually more like 50s retro. Everything science is 50s retro. The vision that the 50s had of science is so much better sometimes in some ways than what we have now, I think. At least it had more design elements. 
they you know they they were kind of short on the details on the whole technology part but they put a lot of design aspect to how things would would be uh would be aesthetically different in the future they can make jetpacks and they can make flying cars the uh, flying cars exist already there's a guy that built them and flies them around you know um fields south of UC Davis uh, the problem with the flying car isn't the flying car the problem with the flying car is people are horrible pilots <laughs> I mean we <laughs> right it's uh, it's it's not that it's not that the car itself can't be built it's that you couldn't trust the general public with it really is what it that's the bigger issue. I mean, what's a helicopter but a flying car? Anyway, really. Why doesn't everybody have the helo pad on the rooftop? Because it would end badly. <laughs> Very badly. Which is another good question. What is transportation like on Science Island? I'm kind of picturing golf carts. Maybe it's uh, little ATVs. Maybe it's... I have no idea. Segways, except I don't, I don't picture. I picture it needing to be a lot of walk. Well, on the hill part, it's very slopey. Yeah, it's Tesla, not Edison. Absolutely. Oh, I wonder if we could have a giant power that uh, wirelessly sent electricity to all the homes. Tesla coils. Yeah, no, I like the self-driving car. That's pretty sweet. And airplanes, yeah, airplanes have to self-fly because a pilot can't keep up with it, right? Pressurized tubes for transportation. You know what's really weird? The dealership I'm working at now has those. They've got the little thing where you put the, you know, the little cylinder and you put the whatever paperwork it is and it goes in the tube and you close it and you, you hit the thing and it goes, and it goes, gets, uh, <laughs> really? Because the dealership isn't that old, I don't think. It's not like, you know, ancient technology stuff. They, they have a modern version of it that they actually use. I think those are so awesome. I think that would be the mail delivery system. Pneumatic tubes, exactly. We, we wouldn't have a mail carrier. We would just have, uh, we'll be postal pickup for the larger packages. But any, any time you wanted to actually send mail mail, it would just like, go <laughs> down the tube. You know, I, I go in there and I just watch them use it. I'm like, send them, some, send them something. Send some paperwork. It's like, well, we don't have anything to ask to go. Just send something, anything. Paper clips. Put something in there. Send it. I want to see it. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's all clear so you can see the thing travel. It's really rad. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite uh, stories was uh, this, this lady who retired while I was working at Sears years and years and years ago but she used to work at a catalog distribution center which was like a 10-story building that had products and bins and orders would come in that would come in from the catalog and they'd get uh, telegraphed up to the different levels saying what to send down and they had these women who worked there who were on roller skates Right, for speed and efficiency, and they would roller skate over to the bin, grab the product, bring it to the center of the building, which is was a very uh, 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 you know eight story tall spiral slide. <laughs> Take the package, put it on the slide, and it would slide down all the way down to the shipping at the bottom. I just thought that was really freaking awesome. <laughs> Passenger pigeons wearing jetpacks. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Passenger pigeons can carry 128 gigabyte memory sticks. Yeah, they, they, they carry way more information than they used to. Has anybody done that yet? Has anybody put a message in a bottle with, like, a movie? <laughs> put it on the flash drive, throw it in there, toss it. Oh, is it too expensive for the flying car? I don't know. I don't know about that, is it? No, oh, maybe it's not fuel efficient. Yeah, that could be, that could be a problem. But you know, everything, every price of the actual, um, the actual car would come down with mass production, right? 
the first Prius was like two hundred million dollars, but yeah, over time. <laughs> By the time the uh, the pigeon finds its way, there won't be USB technology. In, in, oh no! By the time the bottle, in, no, 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 you can find that within a couple of years. It, it takes six months. What was I was listening to something? This is why I thought of that. I was listening to something on NPR with this guy who's like been like obsessively sending messages in bottles for years, and he sent uh, two messages on different days, like one day removed into the same part of the Atlantic. Uh, one showed up, I guess, like a year later in France. The next one also showed up on a beach in France, but like six or seven years later. Something crazy. Okay. I'll be back. I don't, I don't know why I put the headphones back on. It doesn't make any sense. Don't like Nori? Well, yeah, I mean, look. Yeah, I'm not a big Wells fan, that's for sure. Uh... Kind of like Nori, but I know I disagree with him fundamentally on probably everything. But here's the thing. We're comparing them to art. That's There isn't a mortal amongst us that is going to be able to, to step into that role and do what we know can be done with it just as impossible so you know I, I I have that in the back of my mind when I'm listening and going oh, that's not how art would do it but you know 
the alternative is it just doesn't exist at all, right? That's that's the problem with with uh, the comparisons is very. You know, you know what 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 the alternative is, which is not having that <laughs> at all, and having late night political commentary, or I mean, the alternatives out there are just so weak. However, however, Science Island, or just the island. I'm gonna I'm, I'm starting now. I'm picturing it very much like the prisoner. <laughs> Right, um, just the island. Could, would have a media center for sure. That would be a big hub of it, right? So, any of you out there who would want to take on that role of doing late night, and we we could have a radio station. I mean, that would be we could have a community radio station for sure. That would almost be a must. Like, why not? Why not do it? Um, but of course, we could be podcast channeling out twenty four seven. Somebody could take on the late night role from Science Island and be doing be doing the the sciency fiction or the paranormal. Like, why not? I'm not afraid of the paranormal. I mean, well, you know, except for like spooky stuff and like, you know, werewolf people and chupacabra and, and ghosts. And all that stuff. Other than that, I'm not afraid of any of it. Um, I think it. I think it's. I, I think exploring the unknown in fun ways is 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 just, is just, has a scientific aspect to it all of its own. Even if you're doing nakedy up stuff, it's still. It's still a blast. Yeah, and I honestly, I don't, I don't know who. Uh, gosh, I don't know who some of. I don't know who some of the uh, the other guests are. Of course, I do know uh, Hoagland. Absolutely, Richard Hoagland is one of my favorites to listen to because he would spend. The, the first hour, hour and a half, laying out these completely obscure data points. Of, this person worked over here at this facility, and there's a degree of angle on the channel within the Pyramid at Giza, and there was a item left on the moon. Like it's all these random things and then we connect the dots towards the end. It's a fan he's a fantastic storyteller. Really appreciate. It. Yeah, it's it, the obscure conspiracy conspiracy theories and connections between things. Uh, <laughs> war on Mars. How did I miss a war on Mars? Oh no. Mythbusters, Penn and Teller type shows, absolutely. Uh, those are those are very popular. You know, I, and sciency propaganda. I think having a you could have a uh, public policy show that was based on you know scientifically fact checking stuff, calling things out there. You could have the sciency activist shows. Rocking and rolling. You can have science education, science infotainment uh, could be part of that. You know, I, I think there's I think there's enough room uh, when you have a, a collection of people together like that. That everybody should have everybody should have an hour of time at least during the week to to put together a show if they want to anyway. Does Hoagland believe that uh, Phobos is an alien ship? I have no idea. But you know, you know, I you also have to wonder like whenever whenever I hear one of these long term like coast to coast guests, back of my mind is is this a belief that they have? 
Or is this a shtick, a niche that they've become expert on? And it's removed from belief, but they are the person, the expert in the field of werewolves or of alien conspiracies or of they're the ghost expert. Like, I always wonder that in the back of my mind. But then I kind of think, well, you know, why did you become interested and passionate about it in the first place? You must have a good level of belief in it. And if you've ever turned on the AM channels on a Sunday, you know that people can be very passionate about beliefs uh, and believe in them and use them as a method of their money-making in existence. So, yeah. Yeah, but I do like Hoagland. I think I think the way he presents information is entertaining. It's, I, I like it. He he played a mean poker face about whether he believed it, but you know the other thing he did was he was completely non-judgmental. For for a vast majority of the interviews, right, where he wasn't challenging, he would just say, "Suspend all doubt, accept what they say, and then kind of ponder and wonder and question about the implications of if this is true. Then doesn't this mean? Couldn't this mean? Wouldn't this mean? Right? He was he was uh, suspended doubt and allowed his imagination to run with the guest." in a way that uh, <laughs> I my, myself would be way too cynical to get, you know, you, you put any of those guests in front of me. He wasn't right now. It wasn't like me. And I, no, that's, I couldn't do it. I really couldn't. I would get so snarky. <laughs> I would get really snarky. I'm like, so, like there was, oh, God, there was one. And it's funny, too. The timing of this was perfect. There was uh, an episode about, like, mites or something like you know people who have this weird uh, itchy mite infestation and doctors are refusing to diagnose it and everything and it was like uh, the week after we did uh, and it was so cons uh, such a conspiracy thing because it was being denied that it exists but it was this really real thing and you know it was but it was the week after we we had covered the the fact that everybody has face mites like, like, you know, sort of giggling, like, yeah, we've got bugs all over us. What are you talking about? Of course that happens. Of course that exists. Of course that's real. It's not even a mystery. Science isn't refuting it. it can give you, give you a, a laundry list of different creatures that live on your skin. That's not the problem. The problem is why are your nerves acting up? And that's unusual. And it's probably unrelated to any sort of invisible no seams infestation, you probably have a nerve disorder that's making you itchy or whatever it is. But yeah, I couldn't uh, I couldn't be that reserved. I couldn't be I couldn't be that I don't think I could suspend doubt long enough. To do one of those, you know. I mean, I can play in imagination and science fictiony stuff, but when when people are presenting stuff, uh, is and when people are, are presenting stuff as though it were true, true, and building evidence to support the thing, I turn into a debater. Even if it's even if it's something I agree with, sometimes I will want to debate. Like, like I want to play devil's advocate sometimes too. Like I I think I'd enjoy that much more of a show where you I my my perfect show would be inviting on the the religious right and um, talking probably be probably about just about any issue. Uh <laughs> out there. I think that would be more my forte for a show like that. I'd have to bring on constantly people who I completely disagree with. And yeah, and you're right, Twitter Refugee, that could be a complete waste of time. Yeah, it could be. 
It could be, but that's that's more where I get like excited about talking about things is when there's when there's a a little bit of controversy or adversarial nature to it. Sometimes that's one of the things I guess. There isn't a whole lot of that in in this week in science. Um, occasionally, occasionally I find something where Kirsten really disagrees with me, and I can go to bat for an idea or something, but. Um, Typically, we agree a lot. Oh, somebody asked about Jack Feedback. Yeah, nothing is being done. There's no time. I, my time is, I'm like, now I'm working like six days a week. And look at me, I'm itching. This is something else I read. Like, if you read too much stories and studies about mites and stuff, it actually makes you like get a mite phobia. I think I just gave it to myself talking about the face mites. I'm all like, oh, they're everywhere. They're crawling on my skin. Um, people don't understand what science is. We need to use sexier non-science words to get their attention. You know, uh, there was a little of that in, in uh, the disclaimer at the beginning of the show, which was a plagiarized recombobulation of some John Dewey stuff when he was talking about science. Um, there is, there is, uh, I think that the most important thing, and I really think that Twist does a pretty decent job of this when we, when we leave the reporting and we go into the speculation and we start, you know, sort of guessing where this could lead or what an implication of this could be, or I wonder if this also means that, um, to me that's the, that's the core of really where the the science scientific exploration takes place is in that questioning, is in that guessing, is in that extrapolating and trying to figure out other things uh, from one data set, from one one point of reference. Um, and he was ta he was talking in this he wrote this book called Democracy in Education. I think that's what it's called. Uh, brilliant book. It's the greatest book I've ever read in my life, I think, because it explains what education is in a very, or like, like it's a living thing, and the importance of it, and how to how to preserve it, and why why it's so crucial to mankind to to keep it going. Uh, but in that this his sort of conversation about science, he was sort of critiquing. The way that science is taught, where you just teach it with, start with the terminology, the laws, the the orders of the forms of the compartmentalized uh, information, and and from there, you know, somebody's supposed to understand what science is, where where science is much more open to. You know, the, the categorization of knowledge is something you do once your knowledge has been perfected. Once you understand what all those components are, then you compartmentalize them and you sort of can remember them better and know how they fit together in different ways. Uh, but the actual learning of science has to be hands-on experimentation, doing things in the classroom that allow the students. John Dewey really invented a lot of how education is, is uh, how some of it's taken root today, where we have classroom experiments, you know, the way they used to teach home ec would be you would sit in the class and the teacher would read recipes. This is how you make this and describe it to you. Uh, put, the res put the ingredients on a chalkboard versus a home ec class today where the kids go in there and bake some bread or something like that. Uh, he was a very big proponent of doing things hands-on, involving them in the success and failure of doing an experiment in the classroom as that's how you learn, that's how you understand what it is you're doing in science, what it is you're doing in anything that you're being educated in, as opposed to sitting and starting with the completely figured out form of how, how it's been, uh, how the problem has been solved already. Here's the solution to this problem. Here's the solution to that problem. Here's the solution to another problem. Uh, instead, he taught how to solve problems, and that was a big focus of his. And he became the head of our education for a while. It was put up there by president. But this book is, I think, 1916. 
It's available. Uh, it's available online. If you if you Google John Dewey, Democracy Education, you'll find his book online. Be able to read it. It's really awesome. Oh, a doctor had a realization that the Earth is nine thousand years old. You know, it's it's that's pretty that's pretty uh, pretty spot on. Because uh, my mechanic was just giving me health advice the other day. And, uh, yeah, so I need to start. Uh, I need to start doing body body rubs and motor oil. That's how you live longer. Um, well, you know, students and kids can do science in class and they learn more. Absolutely, no, you got you got to have it hands on. You got to, you know, put them through the through the trials of doing the experiment, doing the observation. I think observation is just mo the most important thing. I mean, we're alive <laughs> twenty four hours a day. How much time do we spend actively observing our surroundings? Uh, I'd say it's very little. You know, and partly because in many cases our surroundings, we may not be interested by what we're observing. If we're at work, we may not be really that excited about observing work in fine detail. Uh, but I know I'm going to be looking for which hand people use when they're pointing at each other versus when they're interacting with inanimate objects. I'm going to be checking that out at work this week. Uh, you know, it depends on the public school system that you went to, to a refugee. I tell you, uh, in in my the schools that I went to at, in Davis because it's a very small town. Uh, it's university is the main industry in that town, so most of this, you know, it's got a, one of the highest per capita of PhDs in the country. So the kids I went to school with. A lot of them had PhD parents in different fields. There was a lot of pressure on the schools to keep the science uh, top notch and front and center, along with mathematics. They, they, uh, there was a kid that built a hovercraft in the metal shop class. Um, <laughs> another kid built a working tinier, small scale model of a jet engine. <laughs> <laughs> pretty incredible stuff being built there. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'd say the science classes were pretty thorough. I remember I remember learning about string theory in eighth grade science, you know. Uh, but it, it's, uh, you know, it, largely because of the parents' influence on the, the school system uh, and the expectation that, that science would be front and center. And it's a, you know, back then at least, it was a small town of maybe 40,000 people. The smaller the community, the more the community dictates what is and isn't being taught uh, in their schools. You know, the larger the city is, the less influence any one group of parents or, you know, percentage of the population has. Uh, over over what's being taught where where was this where was this public this top 25 public school that never taught scientific methodology i mean i mean i don't i don't have anything to refer to although i can tell you i went to a school system before that before i transferred over to davis i didn't start in davis i started in the in the town of sacramento and i will tell you i was a straight a student in Sacramento. I mean, I had straight A's in math and English and everything. I just, I, I was the most brilliant kid at my school, I felt like, because I was just a straight A plus student. When I went to, Day when I transferred to the school in Davis, all of a sudden I was a straight <laughs> C minus D plus student. It was literally as though the school system there was a year or two ahead 
of the other school system, both public schools, but the, the community, the community itself dictates what's going to be taught and at what level and at what importance, I think. And, you know, here's another thing, too. Uh, teachers teach on a bell curve, or they grade on a bell curve. They, the expectations are, are that bell curve. You know, uh, if you had the same standards of the teacher in Davis uh, transplanted to that school in Sacramento, everybody in the class is a, is a C, D, or F, right? Like, uh, you would have no A or B students. It just wouldn't be possible. You know, if I'm top of the class and I'm a D student over there, then everybody's C, D, and F, right? Just and what does that t what does that say? It says that's the worst teacher in the world. Well, the teacher has to say, "Well, look, I have to, you know, my, the, what I'm teaching, I have to judge it based on how well these students have progressed, right?" So, yeah, grading is a con, absolutely. It's completely unrelated, which is why they have standardized testing. Standardized testing is supposed to separate. But can you imagine entering standardized testing? having gone to an education system that's two or three years uh, education development behind the next school district. Well, there's a reason everybody in your, in your school isn't at the same score levels as this other school. It's because the education system there isn't as good. You know, why isn't it as good? It's the parents. I mean, no matter how good the teacher, how passionate they are, they have to teach the classroom that they have in front of them. And if there's no place to do homework when the kids get home, if their education ends the minute the bell rings, they're done. They, all they can do is hope to calm them down from the sugar rush uh, breakfast, uh, <laughs> the sugar cereal that they came in on, Calm them down, get them on hyper, which will happen about 11 o'clock. Hopefully there's no sugar in your lunch. So then they're going to be jacked up again until 1. And spend a couple hours actually teaching. Whereas, I mean, and, this is, and, then, and then too, like, you turn into, like, as a parent, you can be a little bit too fanatical. Because I, have, I, had, uh, I was, was getting my, well, then 8-year-old uh, son doing algebra. I was introducing him to algebra and getting him to you know, do all these problems in algebra. Uh, meanwhile, my five-year-old daughter's in the room. She picks it up. She figures it out. She, she understands uh, the, you know, uh, the letters are variable, but you can figure out by going backwards, a little guess and check. You can actually figure out what the number's supposed to be. She got the fractions down. She was doing this stuff. And she just started kindergarten, and I was like, so what did you do in school today? Oh, we practiced counting. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> you know, like, like, I want to pull her out of school. And I was like, no, no, my, I saw my daughter doing, my five-year-old daughter was doing algebra. Like, she figured it out. She used the calculator. She figured it out. No, I wasn't using her to embarrass him. He's he's he can do it in his head. She uses a calculator, so he's got that. Yeah. <laughs> but but it made me wonder too. Is like, well, does it really? Should I really be pushing for them to be, you know, doing more and more in advanced math early? Does it really matter to get it done early? And I and I kind of came to the you know conversation that you know, the conclusion like, yeah, I'm not gonna pull them out and homeschool them and remove them from school, but I can continue to do math education with them separately from school. Like, I can make that one of the things uh, that I do. Oh, and, yeah, they shouldn't touch a calculator until they master multiplication division. I don't know what it is about division, but... Both my kids uh, a little resistant to figuring out division, yet multiplication we got a cinch, and I explained that it's the same thing in reverse, you know, and that kind of uh, that put the light on in the boy's head. But uh, well, she's still just five, so I'm kind of teaching him at the same time. So I think she's going to be the math genius, absolutely. 
<laughs> she's she's benefiting for uh, with uh, from the education that I feel like he's ready for. <laughs> it, you know, four years younger, and and she's she's pretty sharp with the math. She's been picking it up, but she's got her uh, multiplication table down pretty good. Oh, but she's got you know she's got it from memory. She's she doesn't always work the problems through. She's sort of memorized what the answers are. Sort of like when kids. If you read them the same bedtime story over and over again, they'll freak you out because they'll go through and they'll start reading the book to you, and they'll have all the right words for each page, uh, and it's like, oh my gosh, my child can read, but they can only read the book that they've memorized, right? So she's she's sort of memorized multiplication table uh, to for you know three times three up to six times six, you know, a bunch of the variations in there. And I showed her a multiplication table once, and she found it really fascinating and just like sat down and studied it, you know? Um, right, so I'm running an experiment of my own because I have two children with two different baby mamas. And uh, baby mama number one. I went to Montessori school, and my first, uh, my son uh, has been doing Montessori the whole thing, which is a learn at your own speed. Teacher monitors progress. You can sort of accelerate, or you can sort of study towards where your interests lean. And my daughter isn't doing Montessori. She's doing. Uh, she's going through the school system that is like generations of. Uh, you know, her aunts, her mother went to these schools, so and it's it's kind of different and uh, how they're and how they're being educated at school. But I'm really finding that it's the stuff that it's those little things that you do as a parent that are that really stick because you can accelerate well beyond what the school is teaching them. At home, driving in the car, we can throw out some math problems. They want to. They want to watch uh, their favorite show on Netflix. Write up ten math questions. They know. They know that's the drill. They know it's the drill. They want to watch the, their show on Netflix, and they get all excited about doing the math problems too. You know, where if the the, the, the ten questions were too easy, they might ask for another five. Those were those were too easy. That's, what are you giving me? None of this is even, this isn't even hard. Come on. Come up with a couple more and then I'll watch my show. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it is, uh, what is the Khan Academy? Is that the online thing where the guys on a, something else? Huh. I want to go back to, I want to go back to kindergarten. I want to go back to preschool. I want circle time. I like circle time and nap time. Half time in the middle of a of a work day would be so awesome. If all of a sudden at work they lowered the lights and everybody got their blanket out, <laughs> rolled it out in their cubicle, took a little nap, get up, you know, forty minutes later. All right, back to work. Get a cup of coffee. We'll be rolling again. Okay, Khan Academy in the, the video, I, I have seen that, the five-minute videos. Um, I have seen those. Some of those are uh, pretty cool. I've, I've checked out a lot of uh, the iTunes University. A lot of excellent stuff in there. I mean, that's, that's such a revolution to me, having been able to sit in on... Uh, uh, Walter Lewin's MIT courses, Introduction to Physics. Wow. How cool is that? Although, honestly, uh, the my uh, I use it for the wrong reason. I'm kind of, it's almost embarrassing, but uh, Leonard Susskind does these open courses on complex numbers where he sort of... It's not a completely structured course. It's one of these open to the public. It's not a university course exactly. It's an open to the public lecture in complex numbers and string theory and quantum physics. And he'll start out at some point, and it's a lot of math on a board and explaining things and 
and you'll take tangents and people will ask questions and you'll go into an explanation of that. Uh, I pretty much use that if I can't go to sleep. <laughs> it's, his, his voice is... I don't know how anybody could, could take his classes because I find his voice very hypnotic. And it just takes me right from there into Dreamland. And what a great name, Dreamland. Maybe we should rename Science Island Dreamland. Is that, is that, I mean, I know there's the thing in the, you know, Area 51, but wouldn't Dreamland be a nice name? I kind of like it. Mm. All right, I've got to, uh, I've got to, how many, are there still folks here? It looks like we've still got, uh, we've still, there's still some folks hanging out here. See, this is, this is the this is the part. There's got to be a way. We did this before once. When uh, yeah, the UFO notes will come and steal our mailbox on like a monthly basis. All right. Yeah, no good. Is there a way to open this back up again so that can I invite more people? I don't know if anybody's got a microphone and the camera going. Uh, we did this one night where we we had like <laughs> Bob Lazar, where we had. Uh, what if we could kidnap Bob Lazar and have him like build us a UFO? That would be pretty sweet. And we could. <laughs> this would be like we could be like a roadside attraction. We'd have a floating UFO. <laughs> People to come take pictures of next to it. Like, look, I'm holding it up. Right. Yeah, I've got the ops. Um, I don't know if anybody else in here has camera and microphone hooked up. Does anybody else want to be on the on the uh, late night show? We did this once. We had like four people um, in one of these first messing around with Google Plus Hangouts. Four folks, and we did a we did a, like an eight hour <laughs> after show. Oh, you're not in the mood. Okay, well here's the thing. Um, I may not have the controls next week, I guess, because Kiki will be back. But if all things are permitting, what we can do is next week we can bring uh, get you everybody get your microphone, get your camera hook up. I think we can do eight people at a time, and we'll do the after show with y'all, right? Um, that way, uh, it could be a multi-hosted show, like a panel show. We could do a panel late night after show. Where people could be bringing up other things. Across. I think yeah, you were there, Twit Refugee. It was fun. I, I really enjoyed that. I think I thought that was one of the... I think that was the best after show that, uh, that we ever had, really. Good night, Ed. Thank you. Ed, by the way, started uh, the Science Island uh, Facebook site. This is Brainchild. Yeah, I'll try to I'll try to show up to the chat room early, tell people to to get it all hooked up. And uh yeah, we'll do a we'll do a group hangout next week. That way there's more more voices than just my own rambling on and on again. Yeah, tell them to prep for an after show, get in early. I'll try. It's it's kind of tough. It's tough to get in because I'm, like I said, <laughs> working six days a week. They There's still people who are really surprised that I leave when I do on Thursday. I'm like, nope, I'm out. They're like, why? You can't. You've got another four hours. I'm like, nope. See you. Bye. Out the door. I think I got permission to do the show uh, when I got hired there. Or maybe I've just been disappearing at the same time on Thursday enough times that they think that's my schedule. I'm not really sure how it happened, how I got. I don't know if I actually got permission. But nobody has properly called me on it yet. So. Oh, 10 minutes early. Yeah, I can be here 10 minutes early. Um, 
Actually, you know what that reminds me? Here's what I gotta do. I gotta save the link. Bam, there it is, save. So that way I don't have to go into the Google Plus, have all that set up, blah -de blah. All right, minions, I will see you next week. Uh, if you can, if you can, if you are up to the challenge of having a microphone and a camera, uh, we'll do we'll do a group uh, a group of broadcast. Oh wait, do I have to now? See, do I have to take over uh, Kiki's feed? Because she gave me the she let me take over the the this week in science page. Because she's got the on air ability. I don't think I do. But that's no problem. I got the passwords now. I just won't mention it. Just shh, donate. Nobody tell Kiki, <laughs> right? Keep it hush hush. As soon as she says good night, we'll I'll log out, log in under the the her account, get the thing fired up again, right? Yeah, yeah. I've got I got access now. I got all the I got all the launch codes now. <laughs> yeah, we're bringing it. Uh, so when she go when she signs off for the tenth time and finally isn't there, we'll. You know, no, she won't. No, she won't care. But still, don't tell her because it's good to have. It's fun to have secrets, isn't it? Sometimes just a couple, right? We'll, uh, but we'll, yeah, we'll bring it. We'll bring it back up through through that feed. We'll go on air and uh, try to bring in. I don't know how many people we can bring in. I know the limit used to be eight. Does anybody know if that's still the limit? Are we still stuck at? Uh, we're stuck at eight. Eight's a good number. It's probably more people than will want to show up with uh, cameras and microphones. But uh, we'll bring in as many folks as we can and have like one of those Uber election day panels where they've got like too many little boxes on the screen. Eight, maybe 12. Okay, well, we'll find out. We'll figure it out. We'll invite as many as we can. And it's, yeah, yeah, right. It could be about as many as you want. But, you know, it's one of those things too where... You know, even if somebody's just sitting there doing, you know, not, you know, not, uh, not talking or whatever, it's it's fun to see faces. You're all beautiful people. I don't get every, I don't get to see you enough. Yeah, and and yeah, right. I mean, this is right, right, exactly. Twitter refugee. Yeah, have people coming in and out. So instead of like, it would be just like the chat room, only with voice chat. People could come in pop out again, other people could be in, somebody could have a rant that they wanted to do, a haiku, whatever it is, and yeah, but yeah, working setups is tough, I know not everybody's, although, I don't know, doesn't, uh, don't people have, have, doesn't everybody have a webcam now, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people's laptops have it built into them, whether they really use them or not, microphone is tricky, microphone can be tricky. Because you have to, not only do you have to have a microphone, but then you have to find something to strap it to a pole coming from your ceiling. And, you know, it, it's, yeah, just about every nep, uh, nep notebook or something has it. <laughs> the, well, the Twist audience can be computer morons. It's fine. It's, they're not Twit, uh, it's not the Twit audience, Twit refugee, you know. We we're we're fans of science, but we still think that technology runs on ghost energy. It's all vibes that made the computers happen. It's that California vibe, man. It just made computers go. Having a headset, something like that. Wait, usually the biggest hurdle is finding other people who can do it with? Wait, are you talking about dating? What are you? Yeah, wait, if you know your hardware really works until you're a G. Wait, what? <laughs> what are you? Are you talking? To, this is late night with Twit Refugee. Calling in now for the sex advice. What's really stupid too is like I could totally see a show I I would like I think I would be pretty decent at is uh is a football betting show. <laughs> I 
which is a completely different audience. Like, I don't get enough love from the twist audience on when I start to talk football. But yeah. Yeah, do like a do like a pre uh you know, uh, a a pre-game day. Do it do it during Sunday football. We got to do it pre-game cuz you got to be doing the predictions. Uh, like if you're doing uh NFL, you have to do it on Saturday. If you're doing college, you'd have to do it on Friday. If I'm calling uh, high school football games, I probably need to get investigated on Thursday. But but my uh, my ability to pick winners and losers in football is is sort of uncanny. I don't know. I'm mean, a big football fan. I watch a lot of football. I enjoy the game. For watching it, I don't ever. Ha- I don't have any desire to you know play football. <laughs> like ridiculously insane stupid sport anything that anything that causes concussions is that's you that's your brain getting bruises on your it's absolutely retarded uh, it's brain violence that takes place in that but I but I still love it I still love the sport and I can ignore all that aspect of it because no 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 I'm no longer working Petaluma I found a, a new gig in Vacaville, and I now sell internets, uh, or I sell cars through the internets. Um, what team? What teams do I like to watch? Uh, all of them, <laughs> pretty much. I I like uh, I like football, so I can watch any team. I, I'm you know regionally, and how I grew up, a 49ers fan which makes me very excited about the way the team has been because I've also always been a fan of defense. Uh, I've been a big defense fan. I've loved the Steelers teams of the past, the uh, not, too, not too distant and somewhat recent uh, Baltimore Ravens defense. I, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of uh, a really strong defense that doesn't let the offense pick up points and yards. So, huge fan of what the Niners uh, have put together this year. Oh, do a, do a color commentary? Uh, <laughs> the, that would be pretty interesting. Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to really study up or have notes or something handy because I'm bad with names. I always forget, uh, forget names. So, it would have to be a team I'm a little bit familiar with to to at least keep up with the name part of it, but the color commentary and and yeah, I would love to call a game. Although my favorite thing to do is predict things in football, predicting uh, teams and yeah, or scores or outcomes or you know certain things are going to go on. NFL fantasy league, football league has a way to stream a game into a, the hangout. But then, you know, the problem with, with, with talking about NFL or anything as a show is that is private property of the National Football League and no rebroadcast or blah, 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 blah. If you were on watching the Jet game, you're just going to be cursing. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a, yeah. I think that would be fun. I'd like to do. I'd like to try my hat at uh, sports broadcasting someday. I don't know that I'd be particularly good at it, but it would be something I haven't. I haven't tried it. Uh, tried it. Tried to do. And it would be. It'd be kind of fun. But they have to keep such a rapid pace. You know, it's one of those things too. You, I don't know. I might just be too ADD distractible to follow a game. Like I'd be, I'd really be doing the game for a little bit, and then I'd just start talking about some random stuff, and you know, <laughs> just completely off the subject. All right, next week, twist after show, hang out. Week after that, prepare for football Sunday. The only thing is, I, I, I have, I'm at work on Sunday. I can't. I wouldn't be available to actually do the game. And it, yeah. Be able to illegal, oh, illegally stream the game into a hangout. 
That could be illegal. Well, oh, you know what? A Monday night game could work. We couldn't do a Thursday night game, which I hate. By the way, they should get rid of the Thursday night game. No, they have to get rid of the Thursday night game. I mean, not only because I can't watch it, because that is the mo- that's the retarded game that nobody wants to play, right? I mean, the Monday night game, look, you're a football player. All throughout high school, college, most of your NFL career, you, yeah, they're infrequent, but still, you have a schedule. You, you play on Sunday. You heal on, like, Monday, Tuesday. You get back to work uh, Wednesday. Maybe Tuesday you watch some game film of the next opponent. Wednesday you're working out the strategies against the opponent. Thursday you're doing, you know, you're running through some more aggressive drills. You, you got the pads on Friday. Saturday you maybe relax a little bit, rest up, eat right, do your, your preparation for Sunday, then boom, you play Sunday. A little out of the kilter when you got the Monday night game. There's another day before you get a game, and there's less a day less that you have to heal up for the next week. But Monday night football is the big stage, right? The big platforms, the Monday night football, right? So people get ja- uh, jacked up for it, fired up for it, and yeah, it works. Thursday, man, if you played Sunday and then you've already got to be playing that game on Thursday, you're not prepared enough for it. You're physically not in your routine enough for it. And then it's Thursday, and there's a presidential debate, which no, well, <laughs> and or there's a baseball playoff games or whatever, and it's not even watched that much. And then, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, do I work during the NBC night Sunday night game? Uh, usually the first half, and sometimes the second half too. It depends on what's going on at work. But yeah, pretty much I'm stuck there. Monday night, I might be able to do a Monday night game. Uh, but I don't know. We'll see. And Sunday night, <laughs> I can I can do a snarky carbo like you know basically. <laughs> What's his name? What's that guy's name? Who does who does the Sunday? Night? See, I'm terrible with name. I kind of want to choke him out every once in a while because he's got that cackle laugh. It bothers me. Anyway, good night, everybody. I'm gonna hit the. I'm gonna hit the. Uh, I'm going to go to sleep. (laughs) I'll see you next Sunday. And uh, if you can, those of you within the sound of my voice, if you want to participate in the second ever uh, Minion included co-hosting after show, get yourself or hook up your webcam, get yourself a headset mic, something of that nature, and we'll see you here next week after This Week in Science. Good night, everybody.